Everyone set. Speed. And action. I know it was you, Fredo. You broke my heart. You know how to whistle. You just put your lips together and... Hello. Welcome to the Foot and Friends on Film Podcast, discussing everything about cinema. Now here's your host, Nick Baylor. Uh, Welcome to the official podcast of Foot and Friends on Film.com, where we discuss everything about cinema. I'm your host, Nick Mailer. On today's very long episode, we are going to be discussing the cinema of the 1980s. Going from 1980 all the way through 1989. Sitting down with John H. Foote and Alan Hurst. Stick around and enjoy the show, folks. Take your seats, grab your popcorn. It's time for your feature presentation. As mentioned, we're the official podcast of Foot and Friends on Film.com, where our motto is, any film you haven't seen is a new experience. We did this with the 70s, we're going to do it with the 90s, but right now we're doing it with the 1980s. So first off the bat, please welcome our boss, John H. Foote. And also put your hands together for our staff writer, Alan Hurst. So we're here to uh, talk about the 1980s in cinema, and I'm going to throw to John to give a quick introduction and uh, mention a film that we have to talk about right off the bat. Yeah, the 80s was is kind of a strange decade. It's often looked on as one of the worst decades in movie history. But in hindsight, looking back, there were a lot of really fine films released, and many were rediscovered on video, which also exploded in the early 80s. The end of the director's era, the, the massive box office failures of films like Sorcerer, At Long Last Love, Daisy Miller, 1941, and of course, Heaven's Gate brought the end to the director's era and the studios took back control of budgets and complete control over their films. The 80s was also the the blockbuster era and the franchise era when Hollywood studios went looking for films that could be, you know, more than one, Ghostbusters 2 and the Back to the Future trilogy. And it was just, they were looking for movies that could be products more than films, which was a big problem. That said, there were still a lot of great artistic films made in the 80s and we'll cover them all. The movie that that doomed the director's era completely and ended the American Western for a few years was Michael Cimino's Heaven's Gate. And in November 1980, I saw Heaven's Gate in Toronto at the uh, at the premiere screening. It had opened in LA and New York the night before, and I managed to get a pass to go see it and went to see it. And you could just you could feel the room just like a balloon. The air just kind of got sucked out of it over the course of the movie. It wasn't that it was an awful film. It's not an awful film. I mean, there's a lot of beauty in it. There's a lot of good things in it. But Michael Cimino had set himself up for the critics to shoot down. He lied about the deer hunter. He lied about being a Vietnam veteran and seeing Russian roulette used as a method of torture. Um, He said he was a Marine, and he wasn't. He said he'd witnessed Russian roulette, and he hadn't. So the critics were waiting for him. He'd won the Academy Award for the deer hunter, predicated on lies. And when he made Heaven's Gate, the budget went from $8 million to 12 to 17 to 25 and eventually 44 which is well over $200 million today. And it ruined UA, one of the oldest existing studios founded by Douglas Fairbanks, Charlie Chaplin, and Mary Pickford. It ruined that studio. They went bankrupt and were sold to MGM. And that, is, that was a travesty. And that put the nail in the coffin of the director's era forevermore. Let's talk about ordinary people. Alan, I'm going to throw to you on this one. Yeah, this is probably my, one of my favorite movies of the decade. Um, Recognizing um, in that particular of the year, although it won best picture, Raging Bull has its champions, but as a film, it still stands, I think it stands up really well. Uh, Directed by Robert Redford, based on the Judith Guest novel, which was also quite excellent. Um, it's a story about an upper middle class family who goes through the horrible trauma of a son's accidental drowning death and then the surviving son's guilt and attempted suicide. And it really kind of destroys the family. Um, and it, 
a family that would on the outside looking in seem to have it all. Um, I just think it's a phenomenal film in the way it deals with grief, adolescence, uh, the relationship between the mom and dad, the relationship between the dad and the son and the mother and the son and the husband and the wife. Um, it's all really nicely, delicately handled. It's very waspish, and I think that's one of the criticisms that people have hurled against it. But it, for certain people, it feels very real. And I think that's because Redford took his time in telling the story. Um, he took his time in making sure he cast the right people. Um, and I think it's a probably near perfect cast with Donald Sutherland, superb as the dad, Timothy Hutton as the uh, tortured adolescent, Judd Hirsch is a psychiatrist, Elizabeth McGovern as uh, Timothy Hutton's girlfriend, all really nice, very recognizable characters. And for me, um, Mary Tyler Moore as the mom is just brilliant. Um, casting her against type, um, she'd been known as America's sweetheart from the Dick Van Dyke show and the Mary Tyler Moore show. But Redford saw her walking on a beach one day in Malibu, looked at her and said, she's got more to her. Um, and she got the part over some pretty formidable challenges. I think Lee Remick had, was, being considered and Margaret, a few others. Um, but she dug deep um, and I think gave the performance of her life. I, I love this movie. And then God, John? I share Alan's opinion. I think it's a beautifully acted film. Uh, that final scene on the back deck with Donald Sutherland, Timothy Hutton, I've seen it probably 50 times and it still breaks my heart. Uh, they were all nominated for acting awards except Donald Sutherland which is a crime because he should have been. It's, it's a wonderful film. Mm -hmm. John, you want to talk a little bit about Raging Bull, which Alan mentioned? Yeah, Alan brought up Raging Bull, and, and many people believe, as, as do I, that Raging Bull was the year's real best picture and should have won best film and best director for Martin Scorsese. It's a punishing, demanding, tough movie about Jake LaMotta, the middleweight, middleweight champion in the 1940s and early 50s. And the opening, opening credit scene tells you what the movie's gonna be about. Jake's in the ring and he's shadow boxing. So that's the movie, he's fighting himself and he will be for the entire film. Um, Robert De Niro famously got into peak fighting condition to play Jake LaMotta as a young man and then went away and gained 80 pounds to play him as he was as an older man, wasted and gone to seed as a second rate stand-up comedian. And it's a stunning performance. It, it really set the bar for method acting in this generation. Uh, Scorsese chose to shoot it in black and white because New York looks better in black and white, quite frankly. And it captured the period superbly. Um, I think it should have won many, many Academy Awards, far more than the two it did win for Best Actor and uh, Best Film Editing. We talked about The Empire Strikes Back on our Star Wars podcast, but this was another big film this year, 1980. Uh, not directed by George Lucas, but directed by Irvin Kirshner. Uh, it's an example of a sequel surpassing the original. John, you want to add something? Yeah, that doesn't happen very often, where the, the sequel surpasses the original, but it had happened with The Godfather Part Two, And then along came the Star Wars film and the Empire Strikes Back and it happened again. It's deeper, it's richer, it's darker, it's more complex. Uh, there's an array of new characters introduced. Yoda is seen for the first time. The ice planet Hoth, the swamp planet Dagobah. I mean, Lucas wrote up a storm here for this film. And the relationship between Han Solo and Leia deepens and becomes something more. We recognize that Luke has a sister. And then there's the great, great moment where there are literally gasps in the theater when Darth Vader reveals that he is Luke's father. And you could have heard a pin drop. There was that horrible intake of breath and then silence as people realized, good God, it's true. And a terrific movie, vastly, vastly superior to Star Wars and yet not treated the same way by the Academy at all. Alan, you wanna talk about Coal Miner's Daughter? Yeah, again, another, I think, a really strong movie from 1980. Um, and I think one of the best biopics of all time. Um, and I, I wrote about it about a week ago. And I have to recall, I remember going to sit in the theater and not being keen to see this movie because I was not a country music fan. I didn't know who the hell Loretta Lynn was, really. Um, and coming out completely engrossed. Um, and primarily due to the work that Sissy Spacek did on screen. And I think Michael Apted, he captured the the Kentucky um, mountains perfectly, that Butcher Hall or Kentucky, like that whole first part of that movie set in the coal 
mining community. It's just brilliant. You felt like you understood those people and what they were living through. Um, and I think Spacek is phenomenal talent playing that character from I think basically 13 or 14 years of age up until probably her late 30s, early 40s. Um, and you believe her at every step of the way. Um, just really, really strong. And the fact that she did her own singing also um, added a lot to the authenticity. I think for me though, that movie, it just gets that whole era, right? There are a couple scenes where they're driving down the road, they're hawking their Loretta's first single, driving down the road, there's a Patsy Cline tune that comes on the radio, there's this great vintage old car, and it feels like you're in 1959, right there. Um, and to her getting on stage at the Grand Ole Opry with all the chaos going on backstage, but everybody sitting in that audience focused on the performers, um, really got a sense of what it was like to break through in that era. Um, really liked this movie, and it turned me into a Loretta Lynn fan. I've got all her albums, and I can probably recite every lyric she's ever written. Wow. <laughs> Good for you. Good Don't for you. get me I, started. I, Don't I get concur me started. completely. Sissy Spacek gave one of the great performances ever given by an actor. She's spectacular in this movie, so full agreement. Who's going to talk about 9 to 5? Alan. I'll jump in here. Um, we'll spend a lot of time on it, I, but I've asked this to be discussed because it's one of my favorite funny movies of the 80s. Um, really smart look at the glass ceiling that uh, at that point women were still dealing with, probably still are. Um, but what I love about the movie is the freewheeling um, kind of interplay between those three characters, Lily Tomlin, Dolly Parton, and Jane Fonda. Um, they're really fun to watch. The story is terrific. Um, it, it's it's just a really strong comedy with a nice message. And I think Fonda, initially it was going to be a lot more serious, but uh, I think Fonda saw this as an opportunity to make, actually learning to make a point without being so heavy handed. Uh, and I think Lily Tomlin was a bit of the catalyst for her on that one, because once Lily got attached to it, Fonda saw what they could do with it. Um, it's a hell of a lot of fun. It's still quite watchable. Can you imagine being on set, watching them work? No. I mean, I, I'll, I, bet, I, I'll bet they had a hoot. I'll bet every day was a party. Yeah, and, and it comes across, with what I find fascinating about watching it is that of the three, and as much, I love all three of them, Jane Fonda is probably the least interesting of the trio. She hands yeah. that movie over to Lily Tomlin and Dolly Parton. Yeah, very generous. Have I missed anything for 1980? Or are we good to move on? We could we could talk quickly about cruising, right? And go yeah. ahead. William Friedkin's uh, study of the S and M gay world was was a very controversial film in 1980. He'd been wanting to make it for a few years and finally got a go from the studio with Al Pacino as Steve Burns, the young cop who goes undercover to find a serial killer who's murdering young gay men in the S&M underworld. And it was a real look into a world that people didn't know very much about. I knew nothing about when I saw the film for the first time. And, you know, critics were saying it was almost documentary-like. Other critics bashed it, saying it was exploitive. But I, I think they missed this real compelling performance from Al Pacino, who at the end of the movie might have become a killer himself, might have felt the gay world pulling him in and opening up aspects of his own character that he hadn't realized were there before and kills because it happens. And I think they missed that. It came out on DVD years later and to see it in 1980, um, it was banned in Ontario by Mary Brown, the, the Nazi who used to ban movies arbitrarily. He had to go to Quebec or wait, wait for the cut version to see it, which was a shame. I, I saw the movie, I think early 1980, I think. Um, not real. I wasn't out at that point, but I remember being kind of offended that anybody seeing that movie would think, well, that's kind of it. That's what that lifestyle is all about. And it right. took me a long time with the rest of, to look back and think, no, that was just one piece of it. Um, probably a little more prevalent at that time because things were quite underground. Um, but I do recall the first trip to New York, walking out of a Broadway theater after having seen a show, we turned a corner, ended up in Times Square, and we were in the middle of a protest against this film and completely panicked. Um, like 20 years old, stuck in Times Square in the middle of a gay protest. It's like, this is not how I wanted my life to end. So um, <laughs> that scared the shit out of me. <laughs> so. um, 
Moving on to 1981. John, you want to talk about Blowout? Yeah, Blowout's one of my favorite films. Brian De Palma had emerged as a really great director in the 1970s whose films had a real Hitchcockian feel to them. And it's interesting because I'm not a big Hitchcock fan. And yet De Palma's movies really grabbed me. And Blowout, in particular, hit me hard. It's about a sound man who records uh, an assassination of a, of a senator, a rising senator, and a young girl in the car he saves. He saves her when the car goes into the river. And he pieces it all together and realizes that something very sinister is going on. John Travolta, Pauline Kael famously said, John Travolta for the first time plays an adult. And he reminds her of a young Marlon Brando. And she was absolutely spot on. He's spectacular in this movie. John Lithgow is terrific as a serial killer. Nancy Allen is a little, a little goofy in the movie, a little bit strange. And I never really believed the connection be between she and Travolta. But I, I think it's Brian De Palma's best film. I just watched it again a few weeks. Actually, last weekend we watched it. Um, probably for the first time all the way through since 1981. It, it's so good. Yes. Um, you forget how good of a thriller it actually is. And it's so interesting to watch a thriller from the 80s before cell phones and everything else that confuses things. Like everything they're doing, they're, they're going by the seat of their pants at yep. every step of the way. Um, yeah, we did a back-to-back. -back. We did this one and Dress to Kill, um, both De Palma films. They're both excellent. They're both they are. Good. They are. And I think De Palma went full throttle with Blowout. You're on the edge of your seat the whole time. Yeah. And this was one of the first films rediscovered on home video, which, you know, the advent of home video allowed that in the 1980s. And this one was rediscovered after failing at the box office. Yeah. Alan, you want to talk about Ragtime? Yeah, Ragtime, um, a great novel by E.L. Doctorow, um, but a really superb time capsule of a particular period in American history, just as the Industrial Revolution is flying, as um, the moneyed New Yorkers and Long Island group were in full flower, um, immigrants were coming into America in record numbers. Like, it, this was the era when America was full of promise. Um, and it's captured perfectly in this film, I think. Uh, it's very, really beautiful and evocative recreation of the early part of the last century. Um, terrific performances. Howard E. Rollins um, as Colehouse Walker, um, who, the principal man who ends up causing a lot of chaos um, because he's standing up for what he believes in. Um, very, very, very strong performance. But I mean, Riddle Threat, the whole cast is great. Mary Steenburgen was great as a mother. Uh, Mandy Patinkin as one of the, the Jewish immigrant who develops a connection with Mary Steenburgen's character. Elizabeth McGovern um, as Evelyn Nesbitt, who um, quite different from the work she did in Ordinary People, but playing a bit of a tart in this one and causing a few problems. Um, and James Cagney coming back from a long retirement. I wish he had come back sooner. There are a couple of other parts I'd love to have seen him tackle, uh, particularly Harry Antono in 74, but it was nice to see him back um, in a part that was just second nature to him. Who wants to talk about On Golden Pond? John, you want to start and throw to Alan? Well, let's give that to Alan. All right, okay. Okay, uh, again, um, based on a play, um, relatively decent run in, I think in the late seventies on Broadway, um, but it's a sentimental piece. It's not a strong piece. It's a nice piece of work. Um, a terrific film for two older performers um, because it, it, it touches on a lot, a lot of life's key issues. Um, it's about an elderly man, woman who have been going to On Golden Pond all of their life and they're opening up their season there. Um, but the interloper is their daughter, um, played by Jane Fonda uh, in the film, who comes back. And she's always had a strained relationship with her father, who's played by Henry Fonda. Um, and their mom, Catherine Hepburn, is kind of the one who's kept the, everything solid. So obviously the parallels to Fonda's own relationship with her dad were paramount here. And the fact that she got this film made specifically for him as an opportunity to A, give him a part that she thought might win him an Academy Award, um, but also would allow them to work through some of their own stuff. Um, I mean, it's a lovely movie. It's a very nice movie. It's one of the last movies I recall ever going with either one of my grandmothers to see, and they both went to this movie together. Um, so that was still 
proved the point that Hepburn and Fonda still had to draw um, if you were of a certain age. And it's very pretty. Uh, the music score, the score is beautiful. Um, but ultimately, it just feels very light um, to me. A nice movie, but it, it's light. And I agree completely. I, I, I think it's a very light movie. I think it's almost overly sentimental. Um, I think what bothered me most about Henry Fonda winning the Academy Award was that the moment he was cast in this movie, he was going to win. There was no doubt. He couldn't lose. And that's, that's okay. I mean, he should have won 40 years ago for, for The Grapes of Wrath. Everybody knew that. But he finally did win for this one. And he defeated probably the best performance Burt Lancaster ever gave in Atlantic City. And that, that's always rubbed me the wrong way a little bit. Uh, but as a film, you're absolutely right on every level. Um, he and Jane really worked out a lot of crap on this movie that needed to be worked out. And Catherine Hepburn was a big help to Jane Fonda. Yeah. I, said, I think they were talking to some other actresses beforehand, but I'm really glad they landed on Catherine Hepburn because I think Barbara Stanwyck, I think, was one of the names that they had been talking about. Yeah, um, he was. He was. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, did, I have to admit, I would have loved to seen him and Lucille Ball reunite one final time because they had made a movie in the 40s, uh, The Big Street, and one in the 60s, Yours, Mine, and Ours. It would have been nice to see them in their dotage years together again, but Cat Hepburn definitely works. So. And you know what? Lucille Ball might have won an Oscar too because she, she'd have brought something different than Hepburn did. Yes. Definitely. John, can you talk about Reds? Absolutely, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be quick because I want Alan to talk about Reds too. I know he loves it. All right. Warren well, Beatty went to Paramount wanting a lot of money <laughs> to make a movie about John Reed during the American Communist Movement in 1917. John Reed wrote one of the great books of journalism, 10 Days That Shook the World, which is an eyewitness account of the Bolshevik Revolution and the workers overthrowing uh, the Tsar in imperialist Russia. And he was there. He was on the street watching as this happened with his wife, Louise Bryant. And Warren Beatty made this big, sprawling epic. You know, it has some magnificent scenes as the Bolsheviks take over Russia. I mean, the scenes in the street where they're, they're marching and they stop the trains. And then we, we move to the desert when the Russians go to the Middle East. And just massive scenes in scope. And yet it's an intimate, profoundly moving epic about two writers who just can't get on the same page to love each other in the right way. They finally do. That famous reunion at the train station that became the movie's poster is spectacular. Beatty won an Oscar, 12 nominations. All the actors, all the major actors were nominated, deservedly so. And Beatty won Best Director, Stapleton won Supporting Actress and Cinematography. That's it. Mm -hmm. And for me, it, this is like, it's a David Lean film without being a David Lean film, if you know what I mean. Um, perfect, because, perfect. Um, because it's, it, the, the politics are just much more there than they ever would have been in a David Lean film. Um, what for me, it's um, there are a couple of things I really admire about it. One, the scope, one, the visuals. Um, because I think, I don't think he was easy to work with on this film. He had a specific thing he wanted to achieve and I think he put his cast through hell. Um, but I think he got the best performance up to date from Diane Keaton. She's playing a character that's not particularly likable all the time. Um, and she doesn't shy away from that, which I like. Nicholson, I think is very, very interesting and mysterious as Eugene O'Neill. But for me, my favorite character in the film is Emma Goldman and she's played by Maureen Stapleton. She was a less left wing activist from the early part of the last century. Um, interestingly enough, like with both this and Ragtime, you're getting a pretty good depiction of the United States in the early 1900s. Like they're, they're nice bookend films to watch together. Um, and Emma Goldman actually pops up in the previous film as well. Um, I love Maureen Stapleton. This. She's not in it a lot, but I like how she goes. She has no patience for stupidity, um, but you see the woman's compassion when she actually finally believes that Diane Keaton's character, Louise, um, is worth it. Um, it's, it's a nice segue. I, I'm really pleased she won the Oscar for this. It's a beautiful moment in the movie when she finds Louise Bryant in Russia because yeah. getting into Russia was nearly impossible. And she knows exactly what this woman went through to get there. Emma Goldman was deported. She was kicked out of the United States, but Louise Bryant busted her butt to get back into Russia to find Jack. 
and the yeah. look on Stapleton's face, she says, how in, the, how in the God's name did you get into Russia? And at that moment, there's, there's a mutual respect. Yeah, and that era, year, I'm, I'm gonna tell another New York story. Um, we saw The Little Foxes on Broadway with Elizabeth Taylor playing the lead, but Maureen Stapleton played the sister-in-law. Um, oh, cool. Bertie. And we hung around at the stage and she was brilliant in the play. She was so good. Um, and this was just about, I think Reds was just about to open. Um, and she came toddling out of the theater. She had a tumbler full of rye and <laughs> a, a, cu a couple of really cute guys with her. And she just went walking up the street. And I thought, okay, I like you. <laughs> <laughs> to round out the year 81, uh, Alan's can talk about Arthur. Oh, okay, Arthur. Again, I think the 80s, um, not the best decade for a lot of reasons, but one of the things they did really well was comedies. And Arthur, I think it was a really nice throwback to the screw, screwball comedies of the 30s and 40s. Uh, Dudley Moore was having his moment after Foul Play and 10, and I think this captured him at his best. Um, it's just, it's, a, it's almost like a fantasy because that, that, that New York doesn't exist in that way anymore. Um, the fact that we're laughing at somebody who's an alcoholic, maybe not as funny now with her, now that we're a little more enlightened, um, but he was hysterical and really nicely partnered by Liza Minnelli. And I think one of the few great chances she had in film, she actually got to play a somewhat normal person here and she's charming. Um, but, and Gilgood, John Gilgood, um, totally hysterically funny as the butler, um, getting to say those, perfectly bitchy lines and just nailing it. I, I, I best, like this movie. Some of the so best one-liners in movies, you know? Arthur and he knew how says, to deliver them, yeah. Yeah, Arthur comes in and says, I, I think I'll take a bath, and he says, I'll alert the media. And he's <laughs> it, it, just, just perfect throughout well, the and, movie. And when he encounters Liza Minnelli, he basically says, oh, one usually has to go to a bowling alley to meet your caliber of person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's terrific, and he won the Academy Award. Yeah. yeah. Moving on to 1982. Uh, oh, Nick, Nick, sorry. We, we have to talk about Raiders of the Lost Ark. Oh, of course. I'm sorry. I've got no, that's, two that's sporadic okay. lists here going. And I'm yeah, no, I know. I know. Steven Spielberg and George Lucas have a, have a ritual. They take a vacation to Hawaii every summer. And they are on vacation in 1980. And Steven Spielberg was considering directing the next Bond movie. And Lucas said to him, I've got something better. And he described the story and Spielberg said, I'm in, I'll direct it. And the beauty of Raiders of the Lost Ark, it looks like a hugely expensive film, but it wasn't. It cost $8 million because Lucas, notoriously cheap, was controlling the purse strings. And this is how Steven Spielberg found he works best. If somebody else is producing, looking after the money, he won't overspend. And he especially wouldn't overspend his friend's money. By this point, Lucas didn't need a studio. He could pay for the film himself. It introduced us to Indiana Jones, one of the most iconic heroes in, in cinema history, superbly played by Harrison Ford. He's introduced in such a perfect way in this first scene in the jungle. And there's more action crammed into the first 10 minutes of this movie than most films have in their entirety. Just, just a knockout of a film and the beginning of a franchise. Absolutely. I can't believe I almost skimmed over that one. <laughs> It'll happen. Are we good for 81 now? Alan, do yeah. you have anything on Raiders? Uh, <coughs> I am a Raiders fan. Um, if, I'm, if I want to sit down and watch something, I will do Raiders. I'll do the first three. I'm, I'm, I kind of, they lose me a little bit on the third one, and I'm not a huge fan of the fourth one. Um, no. But I will sit and watch all of them back to back to back to back. I can't say that about too many film franchises. I do it once in a while with uh, James Bond. Can't do it with Star Wars. But yeah, there's something very escapist and fun and kind of perfect about those first few films. Yes, I agree. Cool. Um, on a more serious note, we're going to start off 82. Uh, John, talk about Sophie's Choice, which contains the finest performance ever captured on film. In my opinion, yeah, Meryl Streep as uh, Sophie, a survivor of Auschwitz, who is a walking ghost in present day. She is shattered by what happened to her in her past and enters into a crazy affair with paranoid schizophrenic Nathan to beat back death. 
And over the course of the film, we, we're told her story. Uh, back in, in Germany, she was a Pole and sent to Auschwitz where she was told she could keep one of her children. And she had to decide at that moment which child was going to be sent away to die and which one would be raised as a Nazi. And she hands her daughter over to the guards for, for instant death. And Meryl Streep was still a young woman when she made this movie. She learned to speak both Polish and German, and then incredibly learned to speak English in broken Polish and German. And her performance is just astonishing. I saw this opening day in 1982. I was a college student. And as I'm watching it, I'm saying, I'm watching the greatest performance ever given. And I've yet to see anything to surpass it. She was magnificent. Alan, anything to add? Yeah, no, um, phenomenal performance. It's a, and a really, really good film um, as well. I just, it's one of those movies. I, I kind of put this in my same category as Raging Bull. I've seen them. I've probably seen them both a couple times, but there's, it's not something I'm going to sit down and watch too often because I can't. Um, that scene just kills me. And it's like, no, nope, can't do it. But it's, it is a phenomenal performance. Alan, let's talk about Victor Victoria. Yeah, another great comedy. Uh, this one with a, bit, a lot of music in it as well. Um, this was part of Blake Edwards' kind of resurgence as a director in the mid-70s with his, the return of the Pink Panther films, um, 10 SOB. Um, and this was kind of his Valentine to his wife, Julie Andrews. It gave her probably her best film part. I'm going to say Mary Poppins, The Sound of Music, and a few others, pretty strong resume, but it was the part that tapped into everything that she could do. Like she, she was cool. She was sophisticated. She had a very, I don't know, kind of a Marlena Dietrich quality to her in this film. A um, little warmer, obviously. Um, but she's playing a woman who's down on her luck in Paris in the early 30s. Um, she was traveling with a touring company, um, lost her job. So she's out to kind of down and out. Hooks up with Robert Preston, who has this fabulous idea. It's like, wait a second. When she when he comes up with the idea after he sees her um, sock his boyfriend in the nose, and it's like, wait a second. He said, okay, so disguise her as a man and then sell her off as a female impersonator. Um, so the uh, ripe with possibilities for comedy and Blake Edwards as both writer and director doesn't miss any of them and neither does his cast. It's a hell of a lot of fun. It's a very beautiful film. It's, it's a, like this, the art direction and costumes are gorgeous here. Um, but ultimately it's just incredibly funny, beautifully paced and perfectly performed. Number one by Julie Andrews who got an Oscar nomination, but she wasn't winning that year because of Meryl Streep. Um, Leslie Ann Warren as the gangster's mall, James Garner's girlfriend, hysterically funny as the epitome of the dumb blonde. Anything that Jean Harlow or Betty Grable or Jean Hagen had done in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, she encapsulates it all here. It's, it's perfect. And Robert Preston as the uh, flamboyant friend. Um, his pr Probably his best film performance, and he, they were all nominated. Preston definitely should have won. Absolutely. And I think Blake Edwards should have got a, his, he should have been nominated for director, and I think he should have got the adapted screenplay Oscar that year. It's, it's such a smart film. Anything to add, John? I agree with everything. I think Preston's performance is lovely. I, I still laugh till I cry watching Leslie Ann Warren. Just, just a, a wonderful movie. Even the waiter, the French waiter is just just a master of farce and delivery it's, it's it's perfect it's a perfect film john let's talk a little bit about et i think when people look back on et they they recognize that the lead character is a special effect it's not a human being it's a chunk of latex controlled by a group of men operating different levers and the voice was placed in afterwards deborah winger being one of the many that voiced et and the leading actor was a 10-year-old boy. Steven Spielberg put the weight of this movie on the slender shoulders of Henry Thomas as Elliot. And he gives what I think is the greatest performance ever given by a child. A gentle little alien is left behind accidentally and adopted by Elliot, who protects him and takes him into his home, somehow hiding him from his mother, but not his brother and sister. And it's just a magical movie. Pauline Kael gave it the best description I've ever heard. She called it a dreamscape of a movie, and that's exactly what it was. 
I remember looking around in 1982 and grown men were weeping. And I was one of them when Elliot was saying goodbye to E.T. It just gutted us to watch that happen. The visual effects, the cinematography, the musical score, all of it, all of it spectacular. And some great iconic set pieces, you know, that flight across the moon and E.T. coming back to life. And again, that final goodbye scene is just heartbreaking. This, in my opinion, was the best film in 1982, by far. Yeah. You got Alan? No, I'm on side with all of that. Yeah, and when you look back at the Oscars that year, I was like, I always, I just assumed E.T. was a slam dunk, and it wasn't, and it should have been. Yeah. Even when Richard Attenborough was walking to the stage to accept his Oscar for Best Director, he stopped at Steven Spielberg, put his hand on his shoulder, and said, this really belongs to you. So even he knew. I mean, it was ridiculous. I remember standing up and applauding in a room with like two other people the like, first time I watched it, as soon as the credits rolled. John, you mentioned uh, Attenborough. You want to talk a little bit about Gandhi? Well, a little bit. Absolutely. And it'll be a little bit. Um, for years, there'd been talk about a film about Mahatma Gandhi, the spiritual leader of India. And David Lean was going to do it at one point with Alec Guinness, which at the time would have been appropriate, but I think it eventually became very politically incorrect. And when Alec Guinness played an Indian character in the passage, uh, passage to India, the outcry was unbelievable. There were howls of protest as to why he didn't cast an Indian in the part when he had cast an Indian in the lead role in the film. Um, Attenborough didn't make that mistake. He cast a half Indian actor, Ben Kingsley, who was with the Royal Shakespeare Company, and off he went to make Gandhi. And my problem with Gandhi, if you're gonna make a biography, show the character warts and all, show everything that he was. There's nothing in the film about Gandhi sleeping between two teenage girls to test his celibacy. There's nothing about Gandhi denying his wife what would have been life-saving medicine when she was dying. There's nothing about him banishing his sons not just from India, but from his presence. I mean, he was a pretty lousy guy when he wanted to be. And all through the movie, Ben Kingsley doesn't speak in dialogue. He speaks in quotations. Everything he says is profound and great. And it's not his fault. It's John Briley's fault, the writer. Ben Kingsley is there giving a great performance based on what he had. But at the end of the film, you expect him to walk on water. And he wasn't that, he was just a man, an extraordinary man, no question. But show him flaws and all, and then we can connect to him. Then he's a human being. Spike Lee did it with, uh, with Malcolm X, Oliver Stone did it with Nixon. They did it last year with Judy Garland, and it worked. And I think it works much better for an audience if they can see someone that's real. And Gandhi it was never real, not for me. Let's talk about uh, the verdict. Give this one to Alan. Okay, so, okay, this is from 1981. Is this 81 or 82? Right, right. I was thinking absence of malice. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think this is probably my favorite Paul Newman performance. It's because he's playing somebody who's kind of past it, an alcoholic who's kind of lost everything. And this one case is going to bring him back and it kind of is his redemption. Um, and Newman, he still looks like Newman. He still looks really, really good. Um, but you can see that he's been beaten up and that the the, the demon of alcoholism has taken over. Uh, I think he's, I think it's a really, really good film. An excellent courtroom drama. Um, and they're not always the easiest things to pull off, but Sidney Lumet does a really, really good job of it here. Um, with the right, it was written by Mamet, if I'm correct. Yes. I can't remember. Um, and with a really, really strong cast. I mean, he did it in 57 with 12 Angry Men and he does it again here. Um, I, I just, it's a very, very good film and a nice transition for Newman into senior status, I think. Um, and if it wasn't for Hoffman's performance in Tootsie that year, Newman would have been my choice. I agree com completely. I thought Paul Newman was spectacular in the verdict. I love the scene early in the movie where he can't pick up his shot glass and he leans over and slurps it. And in that moment, tells you everything you need to know about Frank Galvin. Just, just a brilliant performance. 
it was offered to Redford first, was it not? Yes, it was. It was. And he didn't want to, he didn't want to look that bad. And he recommended Newman. He said, yeah. talk to Paul. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about Tootsie. The best hey, movie ever made about the art of acting. And in my opinion, the finest American comedy, not, not just of the eighties, but period. Dustin Hoffman plays Michael Dorsey, a bitchy, temperamental actor who can't get work. So he masquerades as a woman, Dorothy Michaels, and lands a job on a network soap opera and becomes a star, a big star of daytime TV. And as he's becoming Dorothy, he's becoming a better human being. And partway through the movie, Jessica Lange's character hands Dorothy her baby and he he nurtures the baby and holds it like a woman would hold a baby earlier in the film we've seen hoffman blow off a baby not even want to look at the kid but now he's nuzzling it and holding it and at that moment i realized dustin hoffman was gone he's gone michael dorsey doesn't exist anymore dorothy michaels is the only one that exists it's a farce it's beautifully directed by Sidney pollock i think this is his best film and he's got a great part in there as as george the beleaguered agent of Michael, who just can't get past the method acting that this guy goes through. He lost a commercial because he wouldn't sit down because he was playing a tomato. And it made no sense. A, tomato's, a tomato can't sit. That's how a method actor thinks. They go, they go so deep into the character. It's almost obsessive. Superbly acted by everybody. Jessica Lange, Bill Murray, George Gaines, Charles Durning, the entire cast. It, a spectacular comedy on every level. Is that all for 1982? Oh, Alan's got to chime in on Tootsie. Yeah, um, again, the theme, there's a theme here. There's a great com there's a ton of great comedies in the early part of the 80s. Um, for me, I, I think Tootsie, Larry Gelbart, who wrote, was one of the writers of the screenplay, um, he is a brilliant com was a brilliant comedy writer. Um, I mean, he, I think he worked on Sid Caesar's programs in the 50s. He did the TV series MASH. He wrote A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum. That guy knew how to write a structured comedy. And I think that's where Sidney Pollock was gifted with a really, really strong script here um, that I think works perfectly. And for me, um, Hoffman as uh, Dorothy, I think I've said this before, like when he came out, I, I totally believed him, but he looked like a, a little more glammed up version of Edith Bunker or Gene Stapleton. <laughs> And I kind of, that, which made him, made me like him immediately. So. Yeah. Yeah. Dustin Hoffman's at his best, usually playing a bit of a dislikable person, but yeah. here as, as Dorothy, he's, he's matronly and motherly. He's wonderful in every way. And you're absolutely right. He should have got the Academy Award this year. Yeah. Moving on to 1983. Uh, like to talk about Yentl. Alan? Okay, Yenta, um, this was Streisand, Barbara Streisand's first attempt at directing, I think relatively successful. Um, she learned from the masters. I mean, she had been working with William Wyler, she worked with Vincent Minnelli, she worked with Sidney Pollock and Bogdanovich. So she sucked it all in. She's not a stupid person. And she took that to tell this story that she wanted to tell based on an Isaac Bashevis Singer short story um, about a girl who's not allowed to learn um, at turn of the century. There's a theme here about the turn of the century as well. Um, in, oh God, I'm gonna say, I can't, I don't know where she is. I can't remember, but it's the Ukraine, it's Czechoslovakia, wherever. Um, her father passed away, her father who's a rabbi passes away um, and she wants to learn. So she takes off and heads to the city to dress as a boy so she can learn. Um, I, it's, I think it's a really nice little film. I got to give Streisand credit because she didn't blow this all out of proportion. There's a little bit that happens at the end that kind of blows it out of proportion. Um, but for the bulk of the film, she's telling a very simple, straightforward story about a woman who's not allowed to do what she wants to do. Um, it's a musical, uh, but not in the way that most musicals are musicals. All the songs are almost interior monologues for Streisand's character. Nobody else really sings. Um, which is, I guess, plays into the whole narcissistic component here, but it actually works really nicely. And it's a beautiful score by Michelle Legrand and Alan Marilyn Berkman um, to tell Yentl's journey. 
Um, the one misfire for me is at the end when she's on the boat heading to America and all of a sudden we're back on the tugboat and it's Funny Girl and she sings this big ballad. Um, she's belting out this song and nobody's freaking looking at her on the boat. It's like, that doesn't make sense to me. However, the song is brilliant and it's a nice way to end. So. And in dad, John? No, he's, he's right on every level. Um, I'm not as big a Streisand fan as Alan is. I loved her in the way we were. I think she should have won the Academy Award for it. Uh, and I like her work as a director. The Prince of Tides is a solid movie with great performances. But, uh, you know, her self-indulgence gets me a little bit. She should not have, have done what she did during The Star is Born. Her behavior was terrible. And she shouldn't have cast herself in The Prince of Tides. Veronica Hamill would have done a great job as the psychiatrist. Streisand's direction was enough. But... Yentl, Yentl proved that she could handle it, proved that she could direct. John, you want to talk about Under Fire? This is one of the great underrated masterpieces of the 1980s. Roger Spottiswood directed this film, and it's about American journalists following war around. And at the beginning, they're in Chad in Africa, and next they're in Nicaragua as the, the Batista government was falling to pieces. Nick Nolte plays a photographer. Uh, Gene Hackman is the anchorman, and Joanna Cassidy is a journalist. And there's a romantic triangle going on there. Hackman leaves, leaving Nolte to hook up with Cassidy. And they become involved in the rebel movement and take a photograph, an irresponsible photograph, that changes the tide of the revolution. It's superbly acted by Nolte, Hackman, and Cassidy. Ed Harris has a, a stunning cameo as a psychopathic mercenary who loves loves killing and does it gleefully and just moves from one place to the next massacring people. It's got one of the greatest musical scores I've ever heard. And Quentin Tarantino used that score for the scene in Django Unchained when the caravan is moving back to Calvin Candy's ranch. And a brilliant film was rediscovered on home video and recognized for the masterpiece it is. Alan, you want to talk about the big chill? Yeah. Um, this was, for me, it's about a group of uh, friends, um, 12, 14 years after uh, school. Um, so coming from, because it's 1983, we're looking at people who graduated school in the early 70s, right at the height of the anti-war movement and all the uh, counterculture thing that was happening. So um, coming out of there probably with some very different ideas, and this shows you where they've ended up. Uh, 12, 13 years later. Um, I think it's a really smart, nice, um, slick commercial film that tells the story of a group of friends um, brought together by the suicide of one of those friends who hasn't made the transition um, in the way that the other friends have or in the parlance of one of the actual characters sold themselves out, sold himself out. Um, it, it, it's a great cast of up and comers. Like at that point, none of these people were huge stars, but they were definitely on their way up. You've got Glenn Close, you've got William Hurt, um, Tom Berenger, um, I'm gonna forget a few others, Mary Kay Place. Um, but just, it's a feel good movie um, with some nice little, some nice messages. Um, it's a comedy with some dramatic undertones not too deep um, and ultimately you're looking at the yuppie challenge here these people are have these these very privileged lifestyles and they're whining about them so there's that piece of it um, but it's it's a really nice snapshot of that counterculture 12 13 years later and I remember seeing it at the time and you're sitting there watching it and I was in front of my early 20s and even then you're looking at these group of characters and you're casting your own friends. It's like, okay, well that's so-and-so that's Karen and that's Rick and that's all these other people that you know. Um, and 10 years later, I think it was about 10 years later, um, Kenneth Branagh kind of did the same things with Peter friend, Peter's friends, um, a film set in England, but again, taking people who'd graduated in the early eighties and 10, 12 years later, this is where they are. So. All right, up next we have Silkwood. This was a, a really solid movie based on the, the true story of Karen Silkwood, who mysteriously died um, as she was on her way to hand over documents that would prove the power plant that she worked at was corrupt. 
And Mike Nichols directed the film, and he'd been away from the movies for a little bit. He, uh, he stepped away after the failure of The Fortune, and it took quite some time for him to come back. And with this, you know, he made one of his better films. Meryl Streep was Karen Silkwood. But the news in the movie, the big news, was the performance of Cher as her lesbian roommate, and also the performance of Kurt Russell. The three of them together are absolutely spectacular. And Streep is playful, she's sexy, she's, she's a bit of a nightmare as Karen Silkwood because she causes everybody nothing but heartache. She's stealing everybody's lunch and trying to get off work and scamming people to take her shift and just, just a hellion in every way. And Cher is in love with Karen and Karen knows it but cannot act on it because she's very much not into girls. But it's such a beautifully acted film by everybody and a remarkable piece from Mike Nichols. Yeah, this is one of my favorite movies that year. And going in with trepidation because it was Cher, I'm always a Cher fan, but I didn't think she had it in her. And my God, did she have it in her. Oh, I, boy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she had a brief period in there in the 80s where she nailed it with film after film after film. And then it stopped, which is always a bit of a regret for me. But yeah, she was, I think she probably should have won the Oscar that year. I know Linda Hunt's pretty amazing in the year of living dangerously, but yeah, I yeah. would have gone to Cher. I think Cher, it's interesting that her, her greatness seemed to stop right after she won the Oscar for Moonstruck. I mean, she made Mermaids, which was very good. But yeah. after that, she, she just kind of faded away. And I agree, she's a formidable talent. Yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, she had one more, Tea with Mussolini. She's kind of, I like her in that. It's not a great film, but I like her in it. It's just, it's just, I think she made some bad choices as well. Like she turned yeah. down uh, Thelma and Louise. Like that yeah. was dumb. That was dumb. Bad, bad, bad decision. Bad decision. We can't round out 1983 without talking about Return of the Jedi. John? Yeah, this was the third of the Star Wars films, the final of the, the first trilogy. And I think the weakest of the, of the first trilogy, directed by somebody named Richard Marquand. Um, again, Lucas chose to just write and produce and pay for it. And it wraps everything up. Uh, Luke defeats Darth Vader. Darth Vader turns to the good side. And Luke always knew he saw good in him, of course. Of course he did. And he, it's he that kills the Emperor, picking him up and throwing him down. And Luke takes off the mask of Darth Vader. And he's this old man. He's, he's not a villain at all. He's this old guy who's face-to-face who's -face finally with his son. Again, we had some major creatures. We had Jabba the Hutt, who's one of the creepiest, most disgusting characters you've ever seen. You had Carrie Fisher in the skimpiest, futuristic bikini I've ever seen. And you had these friggin' teddy bears, these Ewoks. Yep, yep. The minute I saw them, all I could think of was Toys R Us at Christmas time is going to be loaded with these friggin' Ewoks. And sure enough, it was. And you know, everyone knows Lucas is a merchandising genius. And to me, Return of the Jedi seemed to exist for merchandising. No other reason. No other reason. Finally, we're going to talk about Terms of Endearment. To me, this is the, the greatest film ever made about the mother-daughter relationship. We as guys will never understand that relationship. My wife could spend the whole day with her mom, and they'd still call each other that night. And they always had something to say. My dad and I are really close, but when I, was, when I wasn't looking after them, I could talk to them once a week, and we were good. Shirley MacLaine plays Aurora Greenway, who is maniacal in controlling her daughter's life. And Emma, played by Deborah Winger, is not one to be controlled. When she moves away, she leaves her mother devastated, because now the phone bills are going to be enormous, because even from afar, Aurora is going to try and control things. She enters in, Aurora enters into an affair with the astronaut who lives next door, played by Jack Nicholson. And when tragedy strikes the family, uh, Emma gets cancer, we see them rise to the occasion. We see them all rise to the occasion. Aurora becomes a fierce, fierce mother hen, looking after her daughter like a, like a lioness looks after her cub. And Nicholson's Garrett Breedlove, who you don't expect to do anything decent ever, shows up to be with Aurora at her time of need. And she's got that great line to Jack Nicholson, who would have expected you to be a nice guy? And I'm sure that scene between the two of them on the steps is what won them the Academy Awards. It won five Oscars, Best Picture, Director, Actress, Supporting Actor, and Script. 
This was the movie debut of James L. Brooks, who had a long career in television. He's made great films before. He's had two more films nominated for Best Picture, but he's never again been nominated for Best Director. Just, just a work of art. Anything to add, Alan? Yeah, um, my favorite movie of the year, um, and then primarily because of the interplay between Jack Nicholson and Shirley MacLaine. Um, it's nice when you see these type of actors transition into another phase of their career. And I think they were both doing that with this movie. Uh, going from Shirley into her middle age parts. I mean, she got pushed into accepting parts that were way too old for her, but it allowed her to continue her career in a pretty major way. And the same with Nicholson. There's a scene where he's standing there in the driveway and you see his big belly. Um, and it's like, okay, that's a guy who's, he's comfortable in his own skin and he's letting us know it's like yeah this is what i am right now i'm not the same as i was 10 years ago and it's just really nice to watch watch them do that together um i, I yeah really smart film and i've always james l brooks he's one of my heroes uh, he was the guy yeah. behind the mary tyler moore show um he wrote it he directed it he came up with the concept so um that guy can do no wrong as far as i'm concerned and the Simpsons, big influence on me. Simpsons, yes, yes, yes. See his name every time in the credits. All right, so the first film for 1984 we're going to talk about is A Passage to India. Alan? Yeah, I don't want to go into a ton of detail on this one. Um, just at the time, it introduced me to David Lean, and it's, it's an incredibly beautiful film, um, telling a really interesting story based on Forrester's novel about basically... Um, it's the, it's a young woman's sexual awakening in India, um, but against the backdrop of the decline of the British Empire. Um, really interesting film, beautifully done, beautifully scored, beautifully shot. Um, really strong performances all around, particularly from Judy Davis as the lead, uh, and Peggy Ashcroft um, as well, who won the Academy Award that year. And also Victor Banerjee, who played the Indian, who the woman accuses of attacking her. He's really, really good. Um, didn't hear a lot about him afterwards. My one quibble with the film is casting Alec Guinness, who's a long time associate of David Lean's as an Indian. Um, everything else was so right in terms of what they did, but to cast an English actor as an Indian really just felt very wrong in 1984. Coming up next, we're going to talk about country. John? This was part of the Farm Trilogy of 1984. The, the American farmer underwent a, a huge financial plight in 1984, and rock stars gathered for farm aid and movies. They made three films in 1984 that all starred major actresses and all dealt with various plights on the farm. Um, country for my money, was certainly one of the best of them. It starred Jessica Lange as a woman who is facing the loss of her family's farm that's been in the family for, you know, a century. And her husband, Sam Shepard, kind of falls into a depression. So it's left to her to really, you know, take the bull by the horns and keep the family farm in their name and manage not to go into bankruptcy. And it, it kind of recalls the grapes of wrath in a lot of ways. And Jessica Lange is spectacular. She was nominated for the Academy Award she lost to another actress in a, in a better farm film that we'll get to in a few minutes. Um, and Wilfred Brimley is very good as her, as her father, who's watching horrified as his daughter has to dig down deep and save the farm. It was directed by Richard Pierce, who had a, a pretty solid career as an independent filmmaker and never really stepped out of that realm. He was, he was kind of stuck there for life. But Country is one of my favorite films of 1984. Jessica Lange is, is brilliant and a great movie. If you've not seen it, seek it out. Up next, we have Places in the Heart. Alan? Yeah, this is a terrific film. Um, I think it's, um, for me, it's Robert Benton's best film. I think it's even better than Kramer versus Kramer. I just, I like what he does. It's a great story um, set in the depression about a woman who loses her husband tragically. Um, and she's left to just pay the bills and keep things going. Um, so she befriends a blind man and her black hired hand and together with some family, they're able to pull together the crop and get it to market. Um, really, really nicely done. Um, very strong, strong role for a woman. And what I like about Sally Field's character in uh, Places in the Heart is the, the character's growth. 
um, because she's basically dismissed um, by everybody, um, including herself, I think, at the beginning. And you see her grow and the relationship with the, the blind man who's become her um, tenant um, and the others in the film. And it, it's just a really nice, subtle performance and a really solidly told film story within the film. A really well-deserved Oscar, too. She won her second Academy Award for this and gave that famous, you like me, you really like me speech. But I, I truly hope that didn't take away from her performance because I think she's absolutely exquisite in this movie, deserved that Oscar. And John Malkovich and Danny Glover are each spectacular. Malkovich was nominated, Glover should have been nominated. And I completely agree with you. I think this is Benton's best film. Uh, let's talk about Once Upon a Time in America, John. Well, the version you have to see is the, is the long version. It's a four and a half hour crime epic directed by Sergio Leone. And it's a different kind of crime epic because it deals with the Jewish gangsters and their rise and eventual collapse. And it stars Robert De Niro as a character named Noodles, and that's the only name we really know him as, and Max, played by James Woods. And over the course of the, the near 45 to 50 years that it, it spans, we see their rise in the, uh, in the world of the mafia, their cutthroat attitude, the loss of some beloved friends, and then their separation. There's a betrayal, and they're separated for several years, coming back together at the end of the film. And De Niro sees what's been lost. He's, he's the main character. We see most of it through his eyes. It's, it's a demanding movie. There's one scene where a telephone rings probably 25 times with no one answering it. And it, it must have been metaphorical. It must be Leone suggesting the never ending telephones that rang while De Niro was away, while he was in hiding. I don't know. But there's so much in it that's beautiful. The musical score is lovely. Tuesday Weld is exceptional. De Niro gives one of his best performances. And it's so beautifully shot. The studio, unfortunately, mangled it and cut down a four and a half hour film to a 90 minute mess. So the only way to see this is in the restored version on DVD. It in every way is a masterpiece and was one of the year's very best films. Um, next, we're gonna talk about Romancing the Stone, Alan. Yeah, um, this was one of, one of my favorite films of the year and it, it, it felt like a real throwback again. Um, to those road movies in the 30s and 40s, um, where you've got these two sparring partners, a very attractive guy, a very attractive woman. Um, she's kind of all uptight and he's carefree and um, they get involved in this drug thing in uh, Colombia, I think is where the action set. And it's their track through the jungle, jungle trying to get her sister back who's been kidnapped uh, by these drug lords. Um, She's a novelist, he's an adventurer. It's just, it's a hell of a lot of fun. It, it doesn't plague at all. Um, there's, the action is continual. It's really, really funny. And it really showed the chemistry um, between those two, Kathleen Turner and Michael Douglas. They're, they're really fun to watch. And they teamed up a couple more times. Um, but I think this is their best joint effort. The our biggest movie of the year arguably was uh, Amadeus, John. Milos Forman had won the Academy Award for One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest back in 75, and then made two adaptations, the musical Hair in 79, which I think was brilliant, and Ragtime in 1981, which was equally good. For his next film, he, he chose to adapt the Broadway play Amadeus, written by Peter Schaffer, which is a what-if movie. What if Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart crossed paths with Antonio Salieri, the court composer to Vienna? And it asks the question, what if Salieri was the only man other than Mozart who knew that Mozart's music was timeless? And what if he decided to kill him and have Mozart write his own requiem that Salieri would pass off as his own? Every actor in Hollywood wanted these two parts. Every actor in Hollywood auditioned for the two parts. And I mean everybody. Kevin Bacon wanted to play Mozart. Tom Cruise was, was once mentioned for Mozart. Al Pacino was mentioned for Salieri. Foreman went with two unknowns, relative unknowns. F. Murray Abraham would play Salieri and Tom Hulse would play Mozart. And the casting could not have been better. Hulse is just brilliant as Mozart, a giggling, 
wild-eyed pervert who has the genius of God pouring out of his hands onto the composition sheets of music. And F. Murray Abraham, who was a really well-known character actor on stage, but not really well-known on film, is magnificent as Salieri, who is cursed with knowing how good Mozart's music is. He'll listen to his own operas become extinct while Mozart's gain in popularity. And what I like about the film, it's a period piece, which can be dry, but it moves. It's got energy. It's got a constant score of Mozart music. And when, we, when it's compared to the music of Salieri, we recognize the genius. We see just how good Mozart was. And he did something really cool. He colored all of the costumes that Mozart wears purple or pink, and his wigs were the same. So he was kind of a punk rock opera star of his generation, which this generation could relate to. It won eight Academy Awards. It easily could have won a couple more. It certainly should have won for cinematography and is one of the great experiences I've had in a the theater. Yeah, it's, it's a remarkable film. Um, before we move on to uh, 85, I just want to briefly mention this is Spinal Tap, directed by Rob Reiner. Um, arguably the first mockumentary. It follows uh, a fictional hair metal band in the dwindling years of their career as they're on tour. And it's just one of the funniest movies I think I've ever seen. Um, you guys have any thoughts on it? Kind of launched Rob Reiner on a, on a solid career for a few years. Um, Reiner would go on direct Stand By Me uh, when Harry met Sally and A Few Good Men and then just kind of stop. And the last film he made that was anything at the box office was The Bucket List, which I had rather would have rather never seen. Um, yeah. The only way The Bucket List works is if they switch roles. If Nicholson plays the Freeman part and Freeman plays the Nicholson part, then it's something we haven't seen before. But Spinal Tap, you're right, did launch a certain uh, a certain type of film and very well directed by Rob Reiner. All right, moving on to 1985. Uh, let's start off uh, talking about Back to the Future. John? This, this is nearly a perfect film. It was directed by Robert Zemeckis and initially starred Eric Stoltz. And partway through filming, they fired Stoltz because he wasn't funny enough. He wasn't grabbing the comedy well enough. He's a fine actor and everybody had nothing but good things to say about him, but they fired him and replaced him with Michael J. Fox. The problem was Michael J. Fox was shooting family ties all day. So the only time they could shoot was at nighttime. So he would literally have a car waiting for him at the end of the day of family ties, jump in the car, drive to the Back to the Future set, shoot all night, catch two hours sleep and do the, do the same thing all the next day. It's a great film about a, a kid who's transported back in time to 1955 and meets his parents before they became man and wife, certainly before they became lovers, and has to keep them together because if he doesn't, it erases him from time. And perversely, his mother develops a crush on him. And it just leads to all kinds of crazy circumstances, a great deal of comedy. And Michael J. Fox was absolutely the perfect guy for this movie. And this put Robert Zemeckis into the, the stratosphere as a film director. Great, great movie. A lot of fun. And holds up incredibly well. Uh, cool. Up next, we're going to talk about Mask. Alan? Yeah. Um, this is kind of a bit of a re return to prominence for Peter Bogdanovich. Um, not a big, in a big way. Um, I think this film, so we're talking about Eric Stoltz again. He didn't get back to the future, but he did get the lead in Mask as the deformed son. Um, and he's, he's really, really good. And under that ton of makeup, um, he's brilliant. But for me, it's this is Cher's breakout. It showed what she was capable of as an actress, both the drama and the comedy. She was, she was good in this movie, very, very good. Uh, both maternal, both in tough, and a bit of a jackass in terms of her behavior. Um, but like a real mama bear in terms of protecting her son. Um, I don't think her and Bogdanovich got along well during the filming of this, and that probably didn't help the movie at Oscar time. Um, but I think Cher should definitely have been in the running for Best Actress that year. It's a really good performance. It is, and I think I I agree completely. I think she's terrific in the movie. I think she should have been nominated, and I think Stoltz should have been nominated. He was tremendously good under all that makeup. And you're right, Cher and Bogdanovich did not get along 
Uh, by this point, despite the failures he's had, Bogdanovich's ego was still wildly out of control. And that just, that just didn't go well with Cher. And it did hurt the film at Oscar time. Let's talk about Desperately Seeking Susan. Alan? Okay, so this is a Susan Seidelman film that starred the pop icon of the time, Madonna. Uh, and I remember going to see it, not being a huge Madonna fan, but going to see it and being kind of sucked in by the, the quirky charm of this movie. Um, it has a real edgy energy. It's very funny. It's about a bored housewife in New Jersey who kind of assumes the identity, identity of Madonna's character through some silly uh, mistaken identity and of course the whole amnesia thing. Um, but it's fun. It, it, it kind of gets a hint at the lower, gives you a, hint, a, slight, a blink into the lower village at that time and the quirky behavior, the quirky clothes, the people. And it's the one time I think that Madonna, well, aside from maybe, um, oh my God, I'm drawing the bank, A League of Their Own. It's the one good film that Madonna was ever in uh, where she actually had a leading part. Um, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Uh, the color purple, John. I put this on the list only because it was nominated for 11 Academy Awards, and the one award it was not nominated for was Best Director. And a lot of people howled in protest. I did not, I did not like the color purple. Um, I absolutely believe Steven Spielberg directed this because he wanted to win an Academy Award. He saw the Academy Award as validation of his talent. Everybody knew Spielberg had talent. Everybody said that he should have won the Academy Award for E.T., the extraterrestrial, but because he didn't, he decided he had to make this movie. It's based on a spiky, angry book by Alice Walker. The one right thing he did, he cast Whoopi Goldberg as Celie, and she is breathtaking. If it hadn't been for Geraldine Page that year, the Oscar probably would have gone to Whoopi Goldberg, and she would have deserved it. But Spielberg turned a really angry book about lesbianism and finding your own way in the world into a Disney movie. It's so pretty and it shouldn't be. And it's so politically correct and it shouldn't be. It's everything a movie about blacks at this, in this period of history should not be. And just a wrong-headed, irresponsible film from Steven Spielberg. Um, I cheered when he wasn't nominated for Best Director because I didn't think he deserved it at all. Right. I, I, would, I would love to hear Alan's thoughts on yeah, the yeah, go for it. Yeah, I actually had read the book before seeing the film, and I just felt the film was not the, the book. I, I know you're never supposed to be the same, um, but what made me uncomfortable on the page was kind of, I don't know, it felt very Disney-eyes, if that's applicable here. Yeah, um, yeah. It just didn't have the grit. Um, it, it felt very condescending. Um, perfect, it, perfect word. Perfect just, word for it. Like trying to do the right thing, but not really. And yeah. the one performance in the film that I always was kind of questioned, like um, Shugs, um, Margaret Avery. Yeah. Uh, she's okay. Um, but that woman didn't have, she was way too refined. That woman need to be a lot more raucous and a lot more dangerous than she actually was. Um, and I, I think at the time, Tina Turner, he'd originally wanted her, and that would have given the film a bit of, more of an edge. Yes. Um, but yes. Yeah, it just felt wrong. Um, I liked Oprah in the movie. It kind of introduced me to Oprah. She's good. Um, but overall, no. Oh, all I can, uh, my one image of that film, and that's not what we should be walking away with, is two people in a field surrounded by purple flowers. So that's the one thing I always remember when I think of the movie. All right. Uh, moving on to 1986, uh, let's start off with A Room with a View. Alan? Yeah, this is a Merchant Irie film, and this is the one that really took them to the next level. They've been making movies for a while, the director and the writer. Um, Ivory being the director. Um, this is based on an Ian Forrester novel again, and it is beautiful and also very funny and very engrossing. Um, it's a story about the transformation that Italy can have on people. Um, Elena Bonham Carter is the young woman who kind of meets the love of her life while she's on vacation with her aunt in Italy. Um, 
or maybe it's her cousin, whatever, um, in Italy, um, but she denies it. And she goes home and does the right, meets up with Daniel Day-Lewis, who's your more proper, uh, but kind of useless suitor. Um, and it really, it's a very leisurely told film. The first 45 minutes in Florence, um, establishing who all these people are and what their challenges are and just getting a sense of everybody. Then they're transported back to England um, to work through all these, what ultimately are very trivial problems, but they're very engrossingly portrayed on screen. Uh, and the cast is superb. Maggie Smith is a spinster aunt, her cousin, um, nails it. Um, Judy Dench as kind of a risque writer. It's first exposure a lot of people had to Judy Dent. She's, she's very good. And Daniel Day-Lewis as the prig. Um, that in combined with my beautiful laundrette that year really set him on his way in films. It's, it's just, it's a really, really beautiful film and a great way to spend a couple hours. Let's talk about Platoon, John. The tune was written and directed by Oliver Stone, who, unlike Michael Cimino, having claimed to be a Vietnam War veteran, was a Vietnam War veteran. He had two tours of duty. He was twice awarded the Purple Heart and went through hell in Vietnam. Vietnam changed him. He called it a crucible. And he came out the other side a different person in every way. Platoon is based on his experiences. It's based on the grunt soldier the guys on the ground hacking through the jungle, coming upon Viet Cong and trying to stay alive. It's a very powerful, angry movie written by a very angry director who would continue to make really brilliant but upsetting films. Um, watching Platoon today, it doesn't hold up as well as it did when it came out in 1986. When it came out in 86, I mean, it ended this ridiculous comic book mentality that Vietnam had become. You know, in the late 70s, we had Coming Home, to a lesser extent, The Deer Hunter, and then Apocalypse Now. But then Vietnam turned into a comic book war by a virtue of First Blood, First Blood Part Two, the Missing in Action franchise with Chuck Norris, Uncommon Valor, Let's Get Harry, movies where the Americans go back and win the damn war that they lost. And Platoon ended that. Platoon brought it back to absolute realism, gritty, honest realism and won the Academy Award for Best Picture and Director. The weakness today, if you go back and watch it, is absolutely Charlie Sheen. He, he's, <laughs> he's become a joke as a human being, and watching him in this film, surrounded by the great actors in it, Willem Dafoe, Forrest Whitaker, uh, Johnny Depp, Tom Berenger, he just looks out of place. But at the time, a, a real profound piece of pop culture. Uh... Up next, we're going to talk about Hannah and her sisters. Alan? Um, this is kind of Woody Allen's, I don't know, his Valentine to family. Um, and it's a surprising film coming from him. You can tell he's actually in a pretty good place personally um, because he's leveraging love and family and the everybody gets along in this movie with the exception of him and Diane Reese at the beginning, but that kind of remedies itself towards the end. Um, but it's a really nice Valentine to just particularly the women, um, these three sisters, Hannah and her two sisters, so it's Mia Farrow, Diane Wiest, and Barbara Hershey, um, with an alcoholic mom played by Mia Farrow's real mother, Maureen O'Sullivan, and her dad, Lloyd Nolan. Uh, it's just this extended family that they have around them as they're doing this rondelay of relationships and love, and Mia Farrow's married to Michael Caine, it's her second marriage, and he's fallen in love with Barbara Hershey, um, and she's living with Max von Sydow, but she's not happy. So you, all these people are twisting around each other. And I think it spans about two years. And then all of a sudden it's Thanksgiving and everybody's made it off and everybody's happy. And it's, it's a really funny film as well. Um, you get a real beautiful view of Manhattan in the mid eighties. Um, Woody's films are always really nice picture postcards, postcards from Manhattan, but this one, really is quite lovely um and again a terrific cast i think diane weist is hysterical in this movie um she's kind of a bit of a mess at the start she's a bit of a drug addict she's um flitting from person to person and job to job older than she should be in doing those things um and then as she finds her way and actually hooks up with woody's character it's a really nice journey to watch and i think michael kane's also very good in this one as somebody who really has it all um, but not satisfied until he's almost ready to 
throw it all away and realize what the hell am I doing? It's a good performance. They both won Academy Awards, and I think they were both deserved that year. What do you want? I agree, and I I think it's one of Woody Allen's best films. It's it's bouncy, it's jaunty, and every once in a while you run into somebody who says Woody Allen's not a very good actor. Well, baloney, and his performance here is Mickey. Um, who believes for a short time that he's dying is absolutely hysterical. He's got a scene where he's walking down the street with Mia Farrow, and it's one of the best one-liners I've, I've heard in my life. And she asks him, what, do you masturbate? And he looks at her and says, oh, great, now you're knocking my hobbies. It's very, very <laughs> funny. And Diane Weist absolutely deserved that Oscar she won. She's, I think she's one of the greatest actresses in movies. And I was, I was very happy to see Michael Caine win, too. Great film. Mm-hmm. Cool. Let's talk about At Close Range, John. This was surprisingly a box office failure when it opened in the spring of 1986, despite rave reviews. It's a true story. It's based on the the life of Brad Whitewood, who was a small-time rural gangster who stole farm equipment and sold them on the black market. He's played by Christopher Walken, and he is absolutely terrifying. He brings his sons into it, played by Sean Penn, who's little Brad, and his younger brother, played by Sean Penn's younger brother, Chris Penn. And at the, at the beginning, they're in awe of their father. But gradually, Sean Penn's character realizes his father is a murderer, a liar, and a really bad dude. And when he attacks his son and kills his son's girlfriend, Penn wants revenge and goes in and testifies state evidence against him. Christopher Walken was never more terrifying than he is in this film. And when he's in full bore scare mode, the guy is frightening. And this, this is, I think, the finest performance he's ever given. And certainly one of Sean Penn's too. Madonna scored the movie. And the score is, is kind of based on her song, Live to Tell. And it's beautifully done. I mean, I never thought I would praise Madonna in my life, but it's beautifully done. Directed by James Foley who's never really taken off as a great director, but make no mistake, the guy's the real deal. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Up next, we're gonna talk about Down and Out in Beverly Hills. Alan? This is Paul Mazursky, who kind of broke through, I think it was 69 with Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice, and then he did um, other some stuff in the early 70s. And then An Unmarried Woman is his other big touchstone film. Moscow on the Hudson, I think, is also Mazursky, if I'm correct. And yes. So this, this Down and Out in Beverly Hills, it's kind of poking fun at the bourgeois in Beverly Hills. It's a remake of an old French film, I think, called Voodoo Save from Drowning. Nick Nolte plays, plays a street person whose dog wanders off, and he falls, and gets in, ends up in the backyard of the mansion of Beverly, or Beverly Hills mansion of Bette Midler and uh, Richard Dreyfus. Decides to kill himself, jumps in the pool, Dreyfus saves him. And the film kind of follows this odyssey of the impact that Nolte's character has on both Midler and Dreyfus and their two kids and the maid. Um, it's really funny, really some nice observ- class observations, a um, lot to say about materialism um, and relationships and what we think is important and what really isn't important. Uh, it was also a really nice comeback or refer- return to form for both Dreyfus and Midler. Um, he'd kind of fallen by the wayside, had some drug challenges, and after the Rose and a really bad movie in the early 80s, Midler had retreated both back to concerts and albums, but this brought her back with a nice, really nice performance. And kudos to her, she was just 40 and playing an adult um, mother of two almost adult children. And she did it. It's very funny. <laughs> All right, rounding out the year 1986, uh, something we mentioned before talking about Rob Reiner, Stand By Me. This is one of the great movies about childhood, and in particular, the childhood of little boys. Um, There's a great line at the end of the film that you never have friends like the ones you had when you were 12. I I don't necessarily believe believe that. Um, I remember my friends when they were 12. But the best friends I ever had were my friends in college. We're still the best of friends today. But this movie was based on a Stephen King novella called The Body. And it's about four best friends, all 11, 12 years old, who go on a weekend search to find a kid that's been hit by a train and is left to, his body is left in the woods. It's beautifully acted. 
by River Phoenix, who was just on the cusp of a really great career, Will Wheaton and the rest of the cast, and directed by Rob Reiner so beautifully and so filled with nostalgia. The musical score sweeps you right back to that time in history where they are. And Keeper Sutherland is terrific as the bully in the town, Ace Merrill, who's a really bad guy, quite prepared to cut a kid with a switchblade until one of the younger ones pulls a weapon on him and scares the hell out of him, brings the bully down. And it's got a nice scene at the end with Richard Dreyfus, who is the Will Wheaton character grown up, writing about himself and his friends. And it's, uh, it's just a beautiful movie all around. Um, Reiner was nominated for a DGA award for it. He did not get an Oscar nomination, which a lot of people were calling for. And frankly, I thought he deserved a great movie and a, you know, a great study of friendship. All right, we're moving on to 1987. Uh, let's talk about one of my mom's favorite movies, Moonstruck. Alan? Yeah, it's one of my favorite movies as well. I think it's, for me, it may be up there with the best comedy of the decade. I just think it's such a perfectly structured romantic comedy, again, paying homage to family, uh, this time Italian style, um, set in Brooklyn. Um, Vincent Gardini and Linda Dukakis as the parents share as their widowed daughter um but it's it's a it takes i think it's in the span of about 24 or 36 hours um share hooks up with nicholas cage who's the brother of her fiance to let him know that they are going to be getting married sparks fly between those two and um you gotta you get a movie um john patrick shanley wrote it it's i just think it's really nicely structured everybody gets their moment um the the feel of the movie um, is very familiar, very warm. Um, and Norman Jewison just keeps everything moving. You are rooting for these people all the way through. And the action builds to this wonderful scene in the kitchen, as all Italian family films do, um, where they're, everybody's around and there's just waiting, waiting for Cher's fiance to show up and get everything resolved. Um, a, lot, a few bumps along the way and what she finds out about her dad and his extramarital activities and the mom's depression. Uh, it's just so many nice touches throughout the film, beautifully scored as well. Um, and the cast is, they're, they're really fun. Uh, he, Jewison really cast it well, right down to even the smallest part. Took a bit of a risk with Cher, I think. Um, she didn't ever come across as Italian, uh, but she does in this movie, um, and I think she was coached by Julie Bavasso, who played her aunt in the movie, um, to get the dialect right. Um, and she's she's fun. She's really nice. She won the Academy Award that year. So did Lindy Dukakis, who played her mom, um, also in Brilliant. And I think the screenplay won as well. It's a great it's a great movie. Um, <clears throat> next one we're going to talk about is one we've talked about on a couple of episodes prior: uh, Empire of the Sun, John. I saw this the same day. I saw two films that day. I saw Empire of the Sun, and then I went to see The Last Emperor. And The Last Emperor went on to win nine Academy Awards, including Best Picture and Best Director. The best film I saw in 1987 was Steven Spielberg's Empire of the Sun. It's based on the book by J.G. Ballard, which is a memoir about his experiences as a POW in a Japanese camp during the, first, the Second World War. Christian Bale plays Jamie, a young boy who's separated from his parents during the evacuation of Shanghai and forced to live out an existence in a POW camp, which is completely foreign to him in every way. This is a child of privilege who's used to getting everything he wants, who's used to having servants wait on him, and just a spoiled, arrogant brat. And he's brought down to size by the war. And we watch this, this young man try to survive, try to eke out a living in the POW camp. At the end of the film, spoiler alert, He's reunited with his parents and his mother embraces them and pulls him close to her and he's staring up and his eyes are so old. They're the eyes of an old, old man. He's aged 20 years and probably four and he'll never be the same. You just know he's not going to be with his parents long because he can't be with anybody now, not after what he's experienced. And beautifully directed by Spielberg, one of his finest films, the cinematography, the music, and that incredible performance from Christian Bale made this an extraordinary experience. Coming up next, we're going to talk about Hope and Glory, Alan. Yeah, this is, I, I didn't have a lot to say about this one, but what I like about Hope and Glory, it's a John Borman film, 
Um, and you don't get many comedies about the effect of World War II, but what this did was really showed what it was like in a middle-class neighborhood um, during the Blitz. Um, all the different family relationships and how it's like, you just got your dining room blown off, but it's like, I'll pick up the pieces and start going again. Uh, it's a really, I don't know, I, I, I like this movie. Probably it ties back to some family relationships as well, because my on my mom's side, um, her aunt and uncle and cousins and everything lived through the the blitz and it's the it's a nice insight to actually what they had to deal with and on top of it all it's funny um and really nice performance from sarah miles it's one of my favorite movies I, I think when john borman is on he's on and he was on with deliverance he was on with this he was on with the general then when he's not on we get zardoz and uh, exorcist to the heretic mm. but with this yeah he made, he made a brilliant film and a brilliant comedy seen through the eyes of children about what the war was. And I don't think I've ever laughed as hard at a war film as when the kids arrive at school and the school's gone. It's, it's been blown up. And the kids start dancing around and one little guy looks to the skies and says, thank you, Adol. And off they go. <laughs> it's just a beautiful movie, a beautiful movie. <laughs> You know, rightfully was nominated for several Academy Awards. A great film. <coughs> Let's talk about um, broadcast news, John. This this is a great movie. James L. Brooks, um, after his Academy Award success with uh, Terms of Endearment, this time directs uh, Holly Hunter, William Hurt, and Albert Brooks in a great study of television, and in, in particular television news. And Holly Hunter plays a whip-smart, brilliant, young TV producer who was also hopelessly neurotic. She has these spells where she bursts into tears and weeps for several moments every day. And her partner in crime is Albert Brooks and they have a friendship. He wants much more, but she doesn't see him that way. And into their world comes a, a kind of a dumbass, a not terribly bright anchorman played by William Hurt, who looks great on camera, delivers the news well, but is dumb as a post. And as long as he's got great copy to read, as long as somebody's talking in his earpiece, he's good because he's got a real talent for being on camera. And Albert Brooks can't quite believe that she falls for this guy. He can't quite believe he's about to become the big guy on the, on the network. Jack Nicholson has got a terrific cameo as the current head, head network and uh, is terrific in the film. And also Joan Cusack is hysterical in the movie, as always. And what I liked about it was Holly Hunter. It launched Holly Hunter on the road to stardom. She was nominated for the Oscar. She won most of the Critics Awards in 1987. And I, I'm kind of a believer that she probably should have won the Oscar for broadcast news. Seven Academy Award nominations, but nothing for James L. Brooks, which I think is shameful, just shameful. Now for me, this is an interesting one for James L. Brooks because it kind of took and I'm going to go back to the Mary Tyler Moore show because he was the one year, the brainchild behind that one. And it's yeah, yeah. TV comedy, a kind of updating that. So instead of Ted Baxter, you got the William Hurt character. And instead of, um, you know, there's a nice marrying of those characters, but bringing them into a much more sophisticated and realistic persona. Um, but yeah, it's, it's good. Um, I remember the first time I saw Joan Cusack, I'd never seen her before till this one. And oh my God, I fell in love with her. Um, just a bundle of energy, man. I this mean, is working girl like, in and out, like the most inventive comedy actress of her time, I think. Yeah. Like, didn't get the chances she should have, but she could have been that generation's Madeline Kahn. Yeah. Very gifted lady. Very gifted lady. And you're right about James. L. I'd never made the connection between Mary Tyler Moore and broadcast news, but you're absolutely right. Yeah, so you got Murray instead of Albert Brooks. You got Ted instead of William Hurt and Mary for Holly Hunter, right? So. Absolutely. Not perfect. Well, there you go. I learned something today. Excellent. All right. That's why we do this. Uh, <laughs> so uh, rounding out 1987, we got Radio Days. Alan? I asked for this one to be put on the list. This movie, I will sit and watch this every New Year's Eve. Um, I love it. There's absolutely no plot to it. It's just a series of vignettes. Uh, about an extended family who all live in the same house um, in, in Brooklyn. Um, and then all these relationships um, outside of the house with different radio characters. Um, everything relates back to a radio program or a radio personality. Uh, so there's a number of different 
different things happening all at the same time. Eventually, it winds up, I think it's New Year's Eve, 1943, going into 1944. There's a huge sense of melancholy to the whole thing at the end of the film, but also such a warm feeling. And Woody Allen, what I love about pretty well all of his movies is the way he pulls in vintage pop songs from probably 30s and 40s primarily, primarily, but that has never worked better than it does in this film. There is some piece of music um, accenting every action throughout the whole movie. It's a hell of a lot of fun. Mia Farrow is really funny in this one as a um, screechy voiced cigarette girl who wants to be a serious actress. Uh, Diane Weist is again um, playing kind of the spinsterish sister of the trio of sisters who live together. And Julie Kavner, who used to be on Rhoda, playing Rhoda's sister, I think she's kind of the anchor of this film. She does a great job as the mom of the pseudo Woody Allen character. It's a lot of fun. Marge Simpson. Yes, yes. That's why she never has to put her face in front of a camera again. She makes it up off of that. Yeah, absolutely. Very distinguished, uh, uh, distinguishable voice. Um, okay, so we're moving on to 1988. Let's talk about Working Girl, Alan. So this is a Mike Nichols film. I think it was the first one he had done since Silkwood. Um, and it seemed an odd choice because it is a pretty straightforward comedy uh, about a girl from Long Island trying, or maybe Staten Island, I can't remember which, trying to actually just get ahead uh, in the corporate world. Um, played by Melanie Griffith really winningly. I'm not the best, I'm not the biggest Melanie Griffith fan, but this is kind of her little perfect role. Um, Harrison Ford as the uh, dashing corporate guy and Sigourney Weaver playing kind of the venomous boss uh, of Griffith's character who really doesn't have a lot of morals, um, doing what she needs to do to get ahead again. Women face coming at it from a different angle than men, so doing what she thinks she needs to do to get ahead. Um, I just think it's a nice little uh, snapshot of what it was like in corporate America in the late 80s. Uh, it's very funny, um, has a point of view, um, but a really smart script, really brisk direction. But ultimately, um, thanks to Melanie Griffith, it, it's a winner. Let's talk about a movie I love, uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, John? And I too love this movie. Um, the first time I saw it, I couldn't quite believe what I was seeing. We'd seen live action and animation united before, but never like this, <laughs> never like this. The, the two worlds collide and they collide brilliantly in this Robert Zemeckis movie. Bob Hoskins plays a, a down and out private eye, a drunk who is asked to go back to Toontown to find somebody who is killing the tombs. And his brother was killed in Toontown years before, which is why he's now an alcoholic. And Toontown is where the, where the tombs live. And in this film, in this world, the tombs are actors. They, they work within the studio system. They're employed actors and well-known. And they live on, they exist outside Toontown as well. The visual effects in this movie are stunning. There's a scene where Bob Hoskins kicks one of the weasels right in the groin. And you believe it. You believe what you're seeing. Roger Rabbit is a, is a dizzy, dizzy character and works on every level. And Jessica Rabbit, I mean, there were guys in the theater hooting and hollering at a rabbit, at a cartoon rabbit, as she walked down that, that ramp with her hips swinging and her breast bobbling. I mean, guys were... It was embarrassing. They couldn't take their eyes off. Of <laughs> the film was nominated for seven Academy Awards. It won four. Zemeckis got a DGA nomination, deserved. It should have been an Oscar nominee for Best Picture and Best Director as well. My only problem with it today is I find it very noisy. And I didn't find it noisy in 1987. So I don't know if that's me getting old or if it's just the movie itself and realizing what it is. But it, it's... It's extraordinary to watch and holds up remarkably well. And it's notable for featuring uh, Looney Tunes, Warner Brothers characters alongside Disney cartoon characters. Yeah. It's yeah. the only time you'll ever see Bugs Bunny and Mickey Mouse together in the same frame. And I like that with Betty Boop, they kept her in black and white. Yeah. Rather, rather than go color, which would have been sacrilegious, they kept her in black and white, which, which was a nice touch. 
Yeah, and the dueling piano battle between Donald and Daffy Duck. Uh, was, oh, that was great. That yeah. was great. Yeah. Um, let's talk about Dangerous Liaisons, Alan. Yeah, this was based on a play that just actually did well in London and on Broadway the um, year before. Uh, Les Liaisons Dangerous, I think it was called in theater. Um, a really interesting tale of revenge and infidelity and love and th this game. And I'm not as familiar with the plot as I would have been 25 years ago after I watched it a few times. Um, but what I remember most about the film is the deviousness and the viciousness um, and still being sharply funny. Um, and probably one of the most memorable sequences I remember from 80s films is that scene near the end when Glenn Close's character suddenly realizes the impact of all the nasty things that she has done. Um, and that the camera just going right into you see her whole facade crumble. Um, I think this, I think she should have won the Oscar this year for that film. I, I just love her in this movie. I also think this was part of the thing that got Michelle Pfeiffer really noticed. I mean, I think she was really good in Scarface. She was very good and the Witches of Eastwood, but suddenly people started taking her seriously with the one-two punch in 88 of Married to the Mob and Dangerous Liaisons, um, and she got an Oscar nomination. She's very good as well. It's a great movie, and you're absolutely right. The scene where Glenn Close realizes that everybody knows what she's done, and she's responsible for the death of the John Malkovich character, and they boo her at a public event, and she, she just falls to pieces. It's beautifully acted by the entire cast. Even Keanu Reeves comes across looking okay in this movie. Um, interestingly enough, there were two versions of this. Uh, the, the very next year came Valmont, directed by Milos Forman. That's equally good, but of the two, I have to say I prefer this one. Well, let's talk about The Last Temptation of Christ. This was Martin Scorsese's passion project. He'd wanted to make this movie for 15 years. And there'd been various starts and stops. At one point, it was set to go with Robert De Niro as Jesus, which to me would have been grotesque. At another point, it was set to go with Aidan Quinn as Christ, and the money dried up the night before. We finally got the money from, of all people, Garth Dobrinsky from the uh, Cineplex Odeon chain. And he went off to Morocco to make his film. It's based on a book. It's based on a work of fiction by Nikos Kazantakis, a book that was banned in some parts of the world because it dares to ask the question, what if Christ was just a man? What if he was afraid of the voices he heard and what they were telling him he had to do? What if he was terrified of the miracles he could do? What if he had to grow into being Jesus? And when they crucify him, when he's on the cross, He's tempted by a beautiful angel to come off the cross and live his life as just a man. And he does. And he marries. He has children. His wife dies. He remarries. He grows old and then realizes the beautiful angel is, in fact, Satan. And that is the last temptation. And he goes back to the cross. And when I saw the film for the first time, Sherry and I went to the, the college theater, Carlton Theater on College Street, and they were protesting the movie. None of them had seen it. None of them, because I asked. And to me, it was one of the most uniquely religious experiences I've ever had in movie theater. And I don't know what all the fuss was about. I think it's one of Scorsese's finest movies. I think it's one of the most daring films of the 80s and the type of movie that people should be making. So there you go. All right, rounding out the year, let's talk about Bull Durham. On. Yeah, uh, another really good comedy from the 80s. Um, and this one kind of, for me, it showed what Kevin Costner was capable of. He was never going to be a brilliant, versatile actor, but he'd done the tough guy thing. He'd done a really good Western in, in Silverado. Uh, and now suddenly he's this very laid back, easy, romantic lead in a really good comedy uh, about baseball. Um, and his career is kind of winding down. So there's a sense of melancholy there, but of, uh, there's a real sense of there's a real spark between him and Susan Sarandon, and I mean she picks a project each year. She's a baseball groupie um, in this North Carolina town, um, and this year she's focused on Tim Robbins. But all of a sudden Kevin Costner kind of pokes up, and he's like intellectually he is her equal. 
if not her superior, and watching them do this little dance around each other over the course of the baseball season is really fun to watch. Um, Ron Shelton wrote and directed, I think he based some of it on his own experiences. I just, it's a really, um, it's a really charming movie, but funny. It feels very nostalgic. I think it, I don't think it was set in any past time, but it feels like it could have been. Um, there's something kind of 40-ish or 50s. It has a feel that way about it, and it's just, it's a nice movie. You're absolutely right about Costner. He he was terrific, and he he's not a real deep actor. He's not a Brando or a De Niro or a Nicholson, but when he hits his stride, when he hits his mark, he's wildly entertaining. And he was he was terrific in this. He he should have been nominated for this film. Yeah, I think so too. The other movie I liked in much later movie is called The Upside of Anger. Yep. He's good in that movie. Yep. He is. He is. All right, so we're now at the final year of the decade of the 1980s. Uh, I'd like to start off by talking about uh, Field of Dreams. John, you want to take this one? Yeah, Field of Dreams was Kevin Costner again. And this is one of those movies, the first time since E.T., that I remember watching grown men crying watching a movie. And it's based on the Kinsella novella about a guy in Iowa who hears a voice telling him, if you build it, he will come. And so he builds a baseball field, he plows his corn under, builds a baseball field, lights the whole shebang, and ghosts come out of the cornfield. Shoeless Joe Jackson from the disgraced Chicago Black Sox team that threw the World Series. All these famous ball players that were, were disgraced come out to play baseball. And only he can see them. He and his wife can see them and his daughter. And eventually, his brother-in-law and on and on and on. And he goes on a journey across America, finds a writer played by James Earl Jones, who joins him back at the baseball field, sees the men. And then finally the big payoff, if you build it, he will come, was never Shoeless Joe Jackson. It was Kevin Costner's father. And at the end of the film, he's talking to his father. His father's a young man. And he finally calls to him. He says, dad, do you want to play catch? And the scene of these two guys playing catch reduced grown men to tears. It's such a beautifully made film. Costner, again, is, is terrific. And maybe this guy's been better than we've always thought all along. Maybe he's always been a spectacularly talented actor who just underplayed everything. It's a dreamy kind of movie, beautifully done. Was a big box office and critical success in 89 and furthered the career of Kevin Costner. This is how he got Dances with Wolves done, was the success of this film. I kind of think you're right. Oh, sorry, you got some thoughts, Alan? Yeah, no, it's just back to Costner, because I kind of think there's something Gary Cooperish about him in terms of how he underplays. You're right. You're yeah. absolutely right. I think Copper, Costner's probably got a little bit more than Gary Cooper. Um, but if you look at that span of films, um, from The Untouchables, Bull Durham, Field of Dreams, uh, Dances with Wolves, JFK, and then A Perfect World. Like that, that, That's a nice little span of work right there. It is, and he was tremendous in The Perfect World. Yeah, I love that movie. Um, even in the last uh, decade, I got to give a shout out to my fellow geeks here. As much as the film is uh, sort of controversial and people sort of love it or hate it, but Costner played Jonathan Kent in Man of Steel, Superman's uh, earthly adopted father, and he was just absolutely pitch perfect like the guy is he's really i think you you nailed it john when he said you know are we underestimating how just good he can be well he was in a film last year too that i know alan quite liked called the highwaymen where he played the u.s marshal who tracked down bonnie and clyde and he was terrific he and woody harrelson had a lovely chemistry together so he's still got the goods you know yeah, in the Hatfields and the McCoys a few years ago as well. Yeah, he, he won an Emmy for that, I think, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, he did. We should do a Costner podcast sometime soon. Absolutely. Uh, let's talk about crimes and misdemeanors, Alan. Yeah, another Woody Allen film um, from the 80s, I think, that which is probably his best decade, I think. Um, but crimes and misdemeanors was one I wasn't sure of the first time I saw it, and I actually went back and saw it again, and then it kind of hit me. Um, this whole meditation on good versus bad and good people doing bad things and the guilt, um, the meditation on guilt and the impact of what it does 
And I don't know, it, for me, Martin Landau's character, he ends up having his mistress killed because she's a little unhinged and she's threatening to pull his life down. Um, so he goes to his estranged brother and engages him to arrange a hit on her. Um, and this is not a guy you would normally suspect to do something like this. Um, and the, the whole debate around that I found really fascinating. And then comparing it to uh, Woody Allen's uh, journey, falling in love yet again with Mia Farrow, even though he is married to Joanna Gleason, um, but not getting what he wants. Like he wants to become a great documentary filmmaker, but he loses Mia to Alan Alda. Um, and just again, but they're all intertwined because Alan Alda is ultimately his brother-in-law. Um, the whole familial thing again in Woody's movies. I just, there's something really dark and serious about this, even though I think it's a really good comedy. Um, I, I just, I love it. And I think Alan Alda and both, both Alan Alda and Martin Landau are really, really good in this film. And so is Angelica Houston. I don't think she got enough credit for this one. I agree. I, I think Alan Alda should have been nominated for an Oscar. Landau was, but I think, uh, I think Alda should have been right there with him. He was terrific in this. Well, and Lando, essentially, he has the lead in the film, and he was nominated for supporting. I didn't get that one. Like, no, I didn't either. I didn't yeah. either. Uh, John, let's talk about Glory. Glory is one of those movies that seemed to come out of nowhere. It was directed by Edward Zwick, and it is the story of the all-black regiment from Massachusetts that fought in the American Civil War. They were commanded by Lieutenant Robert Gould Shaw, who was 23 years old when he was given this commission to whip these guys into shape. Nobody ever thought they would see active duty. They figured they'd be cleanup guys for after the war. But they were so ferocious, so fierce, and he taught them so well, they ended up um, storming the fort. They took the front line to the fort, knowing that it was a suicide mission, knowing most of them would die. And it's beautifully shot. The cinematography in this movie is just breathtaking. The final shot, you see the, the, the dead being thrown into a mass grave. And the Matthew Broderick character dies during the, during the storm. And the final scene, he's thrown into a grave and his head comes to rest on the shoulder of a black soldier. And it's such a beautiful, poetic, lyrical image. You just, you can't forget it. Denzel Washington won the Academy Award for Supporting Actor as a, as a ferocious slave who just wants to fight. That's all he wants to do. And Morgan Freeman is, is solid as uh, Rollins, a supporting actor who um, becomes the first black officer during the Civil War. It's just a great movie about a little known piece of history and was one of three movies that year to deal openly with black-white race relations. Um, another one uh, that we should talk about is uh, Driving Miss Daisy. Alan? I'm going to throw this one to John because he just wrote about it. So. Okay. I did just write about it. Thank you. Um, Driving Miss Daisy is often uh, poo-pooed as a Best Picture winner, and they attack it for being ultra-conservative. And it is. It is very conservative. Of the three films that year, that dealt openly with racial issues, this was the safest, and this was the one the Academy honored. But I think what people who disparage the film are missing are the performances and the, the study of a, a friendship that really never should have been. Jessica Tandy plays a Southern Jewish woman, wealthy, who loses her license because she keeps crashing into things. So her son, Bully, played by Dan Aykroyd, of all people, Dan Aykroyd, hires a chauffeur, a black chauffeur to drive her around. And Morgan Pre Freeman plays Hoke, this, this gentle black man. And initially she's, she's raging against him. She's looking for any reason to get rid of this guy. She accuses him of stealing a tin of salmon. And as he's, as he's being taken in the room to be fired by Bully, he pulls out a can of salmon that he bought that morning and tells her the pork chops she left for his lunch were a little sour. So he replaces the can of salmon and he instantly earns her respect. And there's a breathtaking scene at the end of the movie where she's hallucinating about what we don't know. And it's hope that she wants. And she gathers her faculty, sits down, takes his hand and says to him, Hope, you're my best friend. And he says to her, yes, ma'am. And eventually Bully has to put her in a home 
and she's now in her 90s. So she ages from 70 to 95, 96 in this movie. And the smile on her face is just luminous as Hulk feeds her at the end of the movie. And it's just a stunning study of friendship. Tandy won the Academy Award for Best Actress. And it was kind of a, a comeuppance, not even that, a coming around for her because she'd been cheated out of playing Blanche Dubois. She was the original stage Blanche Dubois with Brando in the 40s. And she lost the film role to Vivian Lee. Had she played the role, no doubt in my mind, she'd have won the Academy Award too, but she got ripped off. They wanted, uh, they wanted a name. And so years later, she finally gets her crack, her big role, and she delivered and won the Oscar. And Morgan Freeman is every bit as good as she is in the film. And so is Dan Aykroyd, who, who was nominated for Supporting Actor. Anything to add, Alan? Yeah, no, I agree. Um, it, I think that year, I don't know, um, I think it was all about the blowback against Do the Right Thing. Um, because there's no question it deserved its place in the final five. Um, but Hollywood, I think a certain sect of Hollywood was fancying itself a little more edgier than everybody else. Um, I really like Jessica Tandy and Morgan Freeman in this movie. Um, I'm glad they had them. Every actress, I think over 40, wanted a crack at this. Um, but the fact that they went with her made a ton of sense. She actually had a bit of a film name by this point with Cocoon and a few other things. Um, so I, was, I think it's a really lovely performance. Um, yeah, I, I, and Bruce Beresford, this is the third film of his over the last little while. And for an Australian, he had a really good sense of getting a Southern sensibility with Tender Mercies, um, Crimes of the Heart, and this one. He, he did well in that genre. And nine nominations, but no Best Director nomination. Yeah. Which was kind of a, kind of a sin. And mm -hmm. some of the actresses that were considered for Daisy, I would have loved to have seen what Lucille Ball would have done. You know, she yeah. was widely considered. Yeah. And when they couldn't get an actress of, of age, they, they actually considered Meryl Streep, you know, but I'm glad they went with Tandy. She was, she was perfect. Yeah, and Catherine Hepburn at that point, I don't think would have done it justice. Um, no, she was too imperious. She, she, was, yeah. she was too much Kate, you know? Yeah. Um, we've mentioned it. Let's, let's dive right in. Do the right thing. John, you go. This was Spike Lee's uh, study of racism, and everybody that sees the movie thinks it's a study of racism between blacks and whites. It's really not. It's a study of all racism. He has deaf, different ethnic groups look directly at the camera and shout racial slurs right at the audience. And it's set in Brooklyn, New York, in a, a largely black neighborhood where there's an Italian pizzeria run by a white family. And it's all about the relationship between Sal and the pizzeria, his two sons, and the blacks that, that surround them. And Mookie, the delivery man, played by Spike Lee, will eventually start a riot. And it's a direct spit in the face to Sal, who believes he's been good to Mookie, believes he's been good to the community. And yet if you walk into his pizzeria, there's not a single picture of a black person donning the walls. Sinatra's there, Pacino's there, White athletes are there, but no Michael Jordan, no Bill Cosby, no Michael Jackson, nothing. And it's a very powerful film. It's a very angry film. And Alan's absolutely right. The Academy railed against Do the Right Thing because it was so incendiary and upset people so much. And it gave Spike Lee a platform to shoot his mouth off for the next 20 years about why he never gets an Oscar nomination. He should have been nominated. Everybody knows that he should have been nominated for Malcolm X but he became his own worst enemy. Yeah, I agree. It's a very powerful film and it still is. Like I saw it about four or five years ago. It still is incredibly powerful. Yeah. Uh, and a yeah. really strong performance by Danny Aiello. Um, like he did, he got a lot in the late eighties that um, had a bit of a moment. It's just, it's a nice piece of work. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Um, let's talk about when Harry met Sally. Alan? Okay, this is the another Woody Allen film that isn't a Woody Allen film. Um, <laughs> this feels very Woody-like. Even the credits, um, they they uh, hawk the font that Allen always uses in his film. But it's a really charming, funny film. Actually kind of accurate, um, looking at a platonic friendship that, that evolves into more uh, over the course of a number of years. Um, written by Nora Ephron, who is, I, I love her writing. I mean, her short stories make me laugh to this day. 
Um, very, very funny. And, and directed by Rob Reiner. Um, they also steal a little bit from Reds here in terms of interloping older couples to comment on relationships as Harry and Sally are working through their relationship. It's a bit of a Valentine to New York as well um, in the way that all Allen films are. Um, and really nicely done with um, Billy Crystal, who I don't think is, gets enough credit as an actor. And when he's forced to actually act, he's very good. Um, and Meg Ryan, of course, she did some bad things to her face, is absolutely adorable here. Um, I think she's was one of the era's best comedians. Um, not sure, really sure what happened to her, but this is probably her apex, I think. The other um, two I love in this film are Bruno Kirby, as Crystal's friend and Carrie Fisher as Meg Ryan's friend. Uh, really, really nice supporting performances from those two. And they didn't get a chance to do that kind of work very often. Um, that's lovely. And it, it kind of gave us Harry Connick Jr. as well because he did the score and you hear him singing throughout. It's just, it's a great film, very fun. Um, our next film we recently just discussed on our Tom Cruise episode, but uh, we got to mention it here. That's Born on the Fourth of July, John. Yeah, when uh, Oliver Stone decided he would finally bring this to the screen, he tried in the 70s with Al Pacino as Ron Kovic and it fell apart. Universal told him you can use one of three actors. You must cast either Nicolas Cage, Sean Penn, or Tom Cruise. And he very bravely went with Tom Cruise because he thought he could use the Top Gun kid, that all-American patriotic Tom Cruise look for him and against him in this film. And Cruise responded, as he always did with good directors and good material, with a profoundly brilliant performance. He goes from being a 16-year-old high school kid to a war veteran in his 40s who goes to war, can't wait to get there, and then he finds that it's nothing like he thought it would be. Gets shot, gets paralyzed, comes home and realizes America doesn't care. Nobody cares about Vietnam. Nobody cares about the veterans. So he angrily lashes out and begins to protest. And he spoke at uh, the Republican convention in 1968 or 1972, I don't know which, and really, really brought to light the plight of the Vietnam veteran, the fact that nobody was listening, the fact these guys saw things that no soldier, no human being should ever have to see, and is a really great, great performance. The film is dated. It doesn't work as well as it did in 1989, and I really question Oliver Stone winning Best Director, his second Best Director Oscar, but Cruz's performance can't be denied. It's spectacular, and after what he did in Rain Man, knocking it out of the park in Rain Man. Yeah. This man cleared everybody. This this guy's the real deal. This dude can act. Uh, for our listeners, check out our episode, Cruising for Cruise, where John and I did an entire show on the work of Tom Cruise. Lots of good stuff in there. Um, I've let you guys do most of the talking on this one, but uh, for the net last film, I think, of 1989, uh, we'll go around and see if we've missed anything after. But I want to talk a little bit about Tim Burton's Batman. Now, the Batman that had been known to the public uh, for many years was that of the campy 1960s William Dozier-produced television series Batman, where he was portrayed by Adam West. Some people call this version the bright night, uh, as there is none of that dark brooding stuff we've all come to know about Batman now. Whereas um, in 1989, Tim Burton was tasked with bringing a darker, more adult, uh, inspired more directly by the comics version of Batman. And uh, he successfully delivered that with a neo-noir gothic aesthetic. He cast Michael Keaton as Batman, which would start the trend of fan outrage and outcry whenever someone was cast as Batman and then later the Joker. Um, Keaton was predominantly known as a comedic actor. Uh, he remains many people's favorite Bruce Wayne and Batman to this day. He did a great job. Most famously, Jack Nicholson was cast as the Joker and he received top billing and he was perfectly cast for that time and in that role. 
Um, this movie is still holds up pretty well. And although we've seen more earnest and different versions of the character, like I said, it remains a fan favorite. John, can you talk a little bit about what the atmosphere was like uh, back in 89 as this movie was about to happen? Well, the lead up to it was absolute insanity. I mean, the poster had come out nearly a year in advance. The merchandising had already started, the t-shirts, the lunch pails, the, the bed sheets. It was absolutely ridiculous. And you had to wonder sometimes, were they making a movie or they were, were they making a merchandising machine? And when the film came out, critics were divided on it. Everybody agreed it was unique, it was different, and it was loyal to what the comic book was. But everybody kind of wondered why it wasn't called Joker, because it was very much, Jack Nicholson dominated this movie. Michael Keaton, I think, surpassed expectations as Batman and Bruce Wayne. He was terrific. And Nicholson was perfect as, as the Joker. I mean, how could he not be? But he's been surpassed. Heath Ledger surpassed him with The Dark Knight. And more recently, Joaquin Phoenix went by Jack Nicholson in his film, Joker. So, you know, looking back on Tim Burton's Batman, it's a curiosity piece. It did get the whole superhero thing moving. Um, is it a great film? No, I don't think it's a great film, uh, but it's, it's something. It made a lot of money and people love it. It's good. So it's good. It's entertaining. Um, one of my favorite elements of it is the, uh, the March, uh, theme song created by Danny Elfman, which probably the most iconic piece of music associated with Batman. It was reused for the incredibly popular nineties, uh, Batman, the animated series film spawned, uh, a sequel directed by Burton and then two more directed by Joel Schumacher, which destroyed the franchise before Christopher Nolan, uh, surpassed all expectations of what a comic book movie could be with Batman begins. But, uh, Batman in 1989, it set a lot of standards that comic book movies still follow. And one of those that we've seen a lot of, and especially in a lot of these Marvel movies, is getting an absolute talented A-list actor to play your villain. And Nicholson has, has been surpassed, but he was the perfect Joker for that time and place. Um, We've come up to the end of the decade. I believe there may have been some films we've missed. Let's just go around the table and uh, guys, is there anything that we skipped over we should talk about? I think out of Africa, we should have talked about out of Africa a little more. It won seven Academy Awards in 1985 and had a spectacular performance from Meryl Streep. Um, it's, a, it's a love story, an old fashioned Hollywood love story beautifully directed by Sidney Pollack, who gave us Tootsie in 1982. And Streep is, is wonderful in the film. I'm a big believer she should have won the Oscar in 85. Uh, Scarface in 1983 with Al Pacino was critically crucified at the time and yet became a cult classic through video. Good old video bailed him out again. My Left Foot in 1989, the Irish film, uh, directed by uh, Sheridan, Jim Sheridan, starring Daniel Day-Lewis, which won Daniel Day-Lewis the Academy Award for Best Actor, and really, really put him on the map as an actor. Alan's absolutely right. A Room with a View got that going, and he had a small part in Gandhi. But this was the movie that really marked him as a great actor. So those are those are mine. Alan? Um, just a couple, probably a little more fringe. Um, yeah. One of the ones I'm thinking of is 1986's The Morning After with Sidney Lumet. It's not a great film, and there's some holes in the whole mystery thing, but I think it's probably my, one of my two or three favorite Jane Fonda performances. Um, mm -hmm. She nails the alcoholic aging actress in that movie. I think she's phenomenal in it, um, and it didn't get the attention I thought it should have. Um, another one is a comedy from 1985, a British comedy called A Private Function. I think it's one of the funniest films ever. Um, it's all about the rationing right after the post-World War era um, and a town trying to pull together a celebration for the marriage of Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip. Um, and it's this illegal pig um, is the center of all the action and ends up in, it's actually a takeoff on Macbeth. Um, you've got Michael Palin, who is this kind of laid back chiropodist with this socially driven uh, wife of Maggie Smith pushing him forward 
It's hysterical. It's a really funny film. I'm trying to think of a couple others. And Morris, another one from James Ivory and Ismail Merchant, um, another Ian e. Forrester novel. Pretty daring um, in terms of looking at homosexuality in the uh, early 1900s. Um, it's a beautiful film. Um, it's still quite relevant. I, it's some of the ones that I was thinking of. Okay. All right. And before we go, I just want to take a brief moment uh, to take a look at the news. I uh, just wanted to briefly discuss this, guys. Uh, actor Fred Willard has died at the age of 86. Uh, any thoughts or insights on the man? A wonderful actor, you know, probably not as well known as a lot of the people we talked about, but he was very much part of Christopher Guest's ensemble of actors every time he made a film. And a very, very funny guy. And I didn't realize he was as old as he was. I guess he's 86 when he passed. Yeah, I did not know that either. Yeah, I've been on a long time and a terrific actor. I smile every time I look at him, every time I think of him, because you just know, uh, like George Costanza, this guy's going to bugger up in some way, but yeah. you're never sure how. So a wonderful actor, a real loss. Very funny guy. Yeah, I remember um, he used to love him on Everybody Loves Raymond. He played the uh, in-laws of Robert's character. He enjoyed it. Yeah. Oh yeah. my God, so funny. Very funny in, uh, in Anchorman with Will Ferrell. I remember a scene where he's talking on the phone about his son who's constantly getting into trouble at school. And he's like, well, I'm sure that we've both uh, seen our fair share of pornographic materials. Oh, you haven't? Oh, well, my apologies, Sister Mary Margaret. Anyway, <laughs> I was speaking in generality, sort of like a Bob Newhart kind of thing, one-sided phone call. But yeah, very funny guy. He'll be missed. And our uh, condolences go out to his family. Hope you enjoyed our show on the 1980s. Um, we've got lots more stuff coming up. We're going to do the 1990s. My thanks to Alan Hurst and John H. Foote. Uh, check us out on the website for this and tons of other stuff. Lots of great articles. Foot and friends on film.com. Gentlemen, thanks again. Thank you. Thanks. There you have it, folks. Episode number 27. Exploration of the cinema of the 1980s. Thanks for sticking around if you listen to the whole thing. This was a long one. We did it in multiple parts. John Allen and I are going to sit down again and recap the films of the 1990s. That plus a whole lot more. You can expect at least one of these podcasts a week from us. What would you like to hear? Reach out to us on all the social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, especially YouTube. Hit that subscribe button. Always looking for new ideas. Thanks to all our listeners. Till next time, we'll see you at the movies.